powered from the Serino Cigar Company studio in North Carolina and broadcasting from the Ventura Cigar Company studios in California. It's episode 104 of the Primetime Show. Tonight, we welcome Alan Rubin of Alec Bradley Cigars. We'll talk to Alan about all things Alec Bradley and find out how he lives true. And... As always, the Primetime Show is sponsored by Saga Cigars. Every new blend borrows from the past, and the Saga Blend Number 7 has done just that. It is the perfect combination of timeless knowledge of traditional tobaccos and the newer balance that today's cigar enthusiasts come to expect and love in a finer cigar. Leveraging six generations of experience and tradition of the Reyes family, the Saga Blend Number 7 delivers a unique, full flavor, medium body cigar. The cigar is highlighted by a Brazilian wrapper over a blend of Central American and Dominican tobacco. Available in three sizes at an affordable price, Saga Blend Number 7 is sure to please and bring together past and present. And by Drew Estate. Check out and download the Drew Diplomat app for your mobile device. Keep up with everything going on Drew Estate. Experience the subculture that is the rebirth of cigars. Available on iTunes or Google Play. For more information, check out www.drewdiplomat.com. And by Villiga Cigars. Since 1888, Villiga Cigars have been experts in everything tobacco, including offering a wide range of premium cigars for all connoisseurs. Villiga's La Vencedora, which translates to the victor, is the first full-bodied Villiga cigar, and it carries a special meaning to Villiga Cigars chairman of the board, Heinrich Villiga. The Villiga La Vencedora represents to Mr. Villiga the arrival of Villiga Cigars in a premium handmade cigar segment. It was time, in his opinion, to push the envelope and create a legacy cigar that will serve as a proper follow-up to the highly acclaimed Villago La Floridian Clan brand. This Nicaraguan Puro is wrapped in a beautiful Nicaraguan Habano Escuro wrapper, boasting a potent, full-bodied smoking experience featuring highly seasoned and hearty flavors. Be sure to ask your retailer for Villago Zensadora, and you can visit Villago's entire line of premium cigars at www.villagocigars.com. And by Alec Bradley. Alec Bradley. Alec Bradley. Alec Bradley. Alec Bradley. Alec Bradley. Visit alecbradley.com to find out more about the cigars. Live true. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Primetime Episode 104 for this Thursday, August 1st, 2019. It's Will Cooper here. I am in the Sereno Cigar Company studios. I'm joined cross country by my friend and colleague, as always, Mr. Aaron Loomis. How are you doing tonight, Will? I'm, I'm doing good now. I'm doing good. You sure? I'm sure. Yeah. All right. I'm sure. Big night today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big day but the whole day. It was a big day the whole day. Yeah. It was a. It was a. It's been a big week actually, if you look at it. Yeah. But uh, no, I mean it's a. Uh, you know, I can't believe it's like August already, and um, you know, you're gonna be heading to the Rocky Mountains in a few weeks, right? Like three weeks, you're heading. Yeah, looking forward to heading out to that festival for the first time, getting to see what that's all about. But uh, yeah, it should be an exciting time. Yep. I just booked a trip to Miami actually the first week in September. So I'm pretty happy. There you go. Yeah. We're pretty happy. Um, but yeah, no, it's a, we got a great show tonight. Um, and I want to get right into, I think, uh, cause we got a lot to cover tonight with this, uh, gentleman, uh, honored to have, um, Mr. Alan Rubin, the president and founder of Alec Bradley cigars. Alan, welcome to prime time. Well, Aaron, uh, thank you very much for having me on the show. I'm honored to be a guest. Well, we we appreciate we appreciate it as well. So we just want to set a disclaimer for folks who are in the chat room. Uh, there's another Alan Rubin in the chat room. The the Alan Rubin is here. That's Alta, <laughs> that's Altus Rubin. We've been told is, who's in the chat room. So yeah, he's a good guy. Probably. He's a good guy. Yeah, buddy Alan. Yeah. So uh, it, it may come with the name, but yeah, it may come with the name. Yeah. So <laughs> no, all good, all good. So Alan, yeah, thanks so much for taking some time here. We do appreciate it. We know it's uh late. Uh, for you, and uh, we know it's your personal time. We thank you very much. Always my pleasure. Okay. So, Alan, we always like to start the show off, and we, we want to know, in terms of, before, before you even got into the cigar business, how did you get into cigars in the first place? Uh, I was actually, um, I, I mean, I remember I was 22 years old. I was with my best friends and my roommates from college, and uh, we went to a friend of mine's, uh, his father's office in downtown Miami. His father was a very prominent businessman in downtown Miami. They're of Cuban descent. And he had a humidor on his desk. And I was just intrigued with this beautiful, I remember it was a beautiful LED blue humidor. And then he had another humidor that was acrylic on the back and uh, on the back, uh, the back uh, credenza. And um, he saw me looking and he's like, would you like a cigar? You know, it's the first time I'd ever even kind of broached the subject or looked at it. And I said, absolutely. And he gave me two, two, gave me two cigars. He gave me a, uh, the Partagas that was Dominican and the Partagas from Cuba. 
And, uh, and he's like, okay, the Dominican, you can smoke this anytime, <laughs> but the Cuban, you like, it, it was, and, and I, I've used this before, but it was almost like don't operate heavy machinery when you're smoking this kind of feel to it. Like careful of this one. And that's, that was, that was my first, uh, my first two cigars that I ever had. So what were you doing before you got in the cigar business? I was in the fastener business, uh, bolts, nuts, and screws. Um, um, my father had started the company and I was thinking about maybe going to law school. My dad said, Hey, can you come help me in the summers? And I've worked with my father in the summer since I was like 12 years old. And, um, I started just liking business to be honest with you. I just like business and, uh, got into the company and we built the company up. And when hurricane Andrew hit in the early nineties, I changed the focus of the company to do hurricane fasteners for hurricane protection. And, company just kept growing and then someone came and was interested in buying it and uh next thing i know i'm in the cigar business and alan you know a lot of times we talk to people uh get into the cigar business you know obviously they, they come from a family that does that or sometimes they come from the retail segment and they transition over into becoming you know brand owners and manufacturers that wasn't the case with you how did, how did it kind of come about that you decided to get in the cigar business so, it, you know, my, my office opened at 7.30 in the morning. So 7 o'clock in the morning, I had to go pick up a cup of coffee, get in the car, light up a cigar, and drive to work. And back then, you know, it was my office. It was my, family, my family's company. And I smoke in the offices, kind of like I do now. And uh, so every day, every morning, I'd get out of the car with a cup of coffee and a cigar. And right at the point that we were telling people that we were going to sell the company, one of my warehouse guys had asked me, so what are you going to do next? And I, I'm like, I have no clue. I'm going to take six months off, write down a list of my wants and, and, and what I don't want, and I'll figure out a business plan. And he turns to me, he's like, you love cigars, you should get in the cigar business. And that was the beginning of the thought process. And then, um, uh, you know, Salim? Yep. You know Salim, right? Okay, so Salim's Salim used to be in retail, but his cousin was in retail and his cousin was the tobacconist I used to work with when I was, you know, get buying my cigars. And I asked him one day, Hey, is there a trade show? And, and he said, yeah. And I said, well, I can I come with you as a guest just to see what it is? And you walk in at that time, it was the RTDA and you walk in and you, if you don't fall in love, it, just at that moment of seeing competitors talking to one another people in a good mood, smiling. I've been to other industry trade shows. People don't talk to one another. Right. You know, <laughs> yeah. this, everyone's hanging out together and they're smoking cigars. And that night, the whole industry is having drinks together. And everyone was just real. It was just people. And, uh, and then, you know, I always loved the history of cigars. Once I started smoking in my early 20s, you know, if you're into it, you do research, right? And you figure out, Tell me, you know, uh, learn a little bit of the history of cigars and, and the hundreds of years that people have been smoking cigars. And I was hooked. I mean, the first day I was in the show within an hour, I was looking around like, how do I get in? So. So then what was the next step? Like trying to, you know, make that vision happen. How, how did you kind of progress? Um, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. I'm a gringo and I speak no Spanish. And I'm like, oh, this is a perfect business to get into. And uh, <laughs> um, I, I actually went into the yellow pages back then and started. Yeah, okay. I just dated myself. And no, I it's funny. I, I haven't heard anyone say yellow pages in a while. I'm I, a yellow pages guy too. Yeah. yeah. But I, it, and I started looking up, I figured Miami, a lot of people, you know, in and around cigars. And I looked up um, tobacco dealers. I didn't know where to start. And I ended up getting a lunch meeting with the number one importer uh, and processor of Cameroon tobacco. And, uh, and I walked in, I went to the little Cuban bakery and I bought like all these pastelitos and I bought all these little desserts. And I came in as like a, like a peace offering almost like, you know, hi, I'm a gringo and I don't know what to say, but I want to get in the cigar business. And he actually turned to me and he said, you know, this was in the, in the, in the mid nineties. And he's like, people come to my office with satchels of cash and mm -hmm. you're bringing me desserts. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like, sit down. And I sat down with him and we lit up cigars and he said, okay, let's go to lunch. And you know, he kind of walked me through the beginning part of the process. He just accepted me in based on the fact that 
I was this guy that was passionate and he could tell I wanted to do the right thing. I wasn't just going to be in it for the quick dollar. He could kind of feel that. And so um, I got some names when I was at the show, by the way, I had picked up some cards and names of people who were making cigars and I just started rifling through business cards. And I found one guy uh, in Honduras to start making cigars for me. And he didn't have the greatest reputation, but everyone was busy back in the nineties. So, mm. you know, I didn't have many options and uh, it, it didn't work out well, but at that point I was there and it was just a matter of trying to make the best of it. So was Honduras a, a target of yours or just kind of happened to work out based on who you could uh, kind of get in contact with? It, w- it was, it was more the latter. It was the fact that um, I knew eventually I would, would have to be down in Central America to get mm-hmm. it done. Uh, but the guy from Honduras said, Hey, I'll make you, I'll make you 10,000 cigars. Right. And so that was, that was my shot. And I, and I jumped in. So, but what was interesting was, though this guy didn't have the greatest reputation and truly he ended up stealing money from me. Um, he was one of the very few people that were not great in this business, but I ended up going to a little factory actually in Miami that had a dozen rollers. And that guy spent, I spent three days a week with him Mm -hmm. and learned about tobacco and tobacco processing in this little factory in Miami. Uh, and that guy was truly my mentor. So who was that? Per- who was that person? His name is Carlos Fantasia. And that was the name of his brand Fantasia. And he would buy, he would buy like partial bales of tobacco and he would do this cool fermentation process, like in black 55 gallon of like plastic bags. Right. And then put them in a garbage can and let them ferment. And, and I was there every day, just involved in the process. And he would teach me how to recognize tobaccos, whether it was from Nicaragua or Dominican Republic. And he found a way through his processing to really bring the most out of each of the tobaccos he was using. So I, I just learned a lot. I saw the processes every day. He was really kind to me and it was good for him. I was bringing him business mm-hmm. and, and he in turn was teaching me the intricate side from the beginning of the cigar business. Nice. Yeah. What at the time you were launching was, and I'm looking. Was this around the time that the cigar bust had happened, or was this still the boom time? No, it was one of my other very important decisions was to get in when there were a hundred million extra cigars imported into the United States. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good time to jump in, and right. <laughs> I I know nothing. I don't speak the language, and there's a glut of a hundred million extra cigars. In right. Here. Now's right. a good business. Good time to come into the business, yeah. yeah the right. business plan was terrible from the beginning. <laughs> now, you had a cigar called Bogey Stogies? Uh, my first cigar, yeah. That was the first cigar. Okay, that was my question, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, what happened was really, you know, I'm, a, I'm born and raised in Florida. Um, we play golf here 12 months out of the year. And I thought, well, uh, nothing better than smoking a cigar on the golf course. And so I set up a whole business opportunity to sell cigars on golf courses. And that's how I started. Uh, just calling, getting humidors, acrylic humidors made and sending cigars out to golf courses. So I didn't get into the premium side of the business or the tobacconist side of the business until uh, December of really 1999. Hmm. When now you, I noticed someone that you, you met um, was that Ralph Montero. Um, When did you meet Ralph? Was that around the time you met Ralph? Um, I had, uh, I probably met Ralph in 1998 or 1999. Um, and it was interesting because the very first manufacturer that I went to who ended up not doing good by me, uh, I was in there trying to get some cigars and issues. And as I think, as I was walking out, Ralph was walking in and we just said hello and met. And I had known his name because Ralph at, even at that time, many years ago, he'd grown up in the cigar business. And so I knew who he was and uh, we exchanged business cards. And that was the beginning. I mean, he, um, Ralph had a brand called Montero Cigars at the time. And he was very close with Hanky Kellner uh, from Davidoff. And he went on his own. He actually, he worked for, I don't know if you know the name, Pedro Martin. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So Pedro is his uncle. Pedro was oh, his wow. uncle. So he started at the age of 18 working for his uncle. 
So he grew up really in the cigar business and he had gone on his own and I was struggling and he was struggling. And I called him up and I said, Hey man, I need some, I need some help. And I know you have an accounting background and um, you know, could you help me? And he needed the money and I needed the help. And he said, yeah, I can, <laughs> this is just Ralph. I can commit to you part time. <laughs> and I said, okay. And his part time was like 45 hours. Right. <laughs> right. Right. So I'm like, okay, well, this was a deal. And, um, and then at one point we started to get some momentum and grow and, uh, he introduced me to Hanky. And at that time, if you think about it at that time in, in like 1999, everyone's productions were cut in half because the boom was over. Essentially it was, boom went to bust and Hanky wanted production and I was really struggling. And, uh, he said, Hank, he wants to maybe do a cigar with you. And I'm like, you're, you're nuts. I can't sell what I have now. And, yeah. uh, and then we made a deal. And that was the beginning. That was Occidental Reserve. And it was just still on the market today. But that's what was my turnaround cigar. And that's still produced today at, at, at a DR? It is. Okay, wow. You know, like, yeah. And was this the time that you branded the company Alec Bradley around this time? Well, it was the company in itself. The corporation was always Alec Bradley. We were just the DBA bogey stogies. Right. Uh, and then, you know, essentially we just went back to, to Alec Bradley as a name. Okay. Yeah. So obviously bringing Ralph in, would you, would you say that was a pivotal point in terms of the development of the company? Uh, take us through a little bit of those, like once Ralph came in, what were some of the early things following Occidental Reserve that really you think started to launch the company uh, in, into, the, into a good trajectory? Well, yeah, well, the, the interesting story about it, Occidental is, you know, at, at one point I had an original partner um, and he, he just wasn't really into cigars. He wasn't actually, and it wasn't, it's not a personal thing. He just wasn't really proud to say he was in the cigar business. He had two young kids. He didn't know how to really explain it. We were, we, we were friends for many years before uh, he sold his company. I sold my company around the same time. We said, Hey, why don't we partner up? And, um, he left in April of 1999 and Ralph had come in and then we were working on, uh, working on a cigar with Hanky, um, that Ralph kind of made happen. And the truth is, is, uh, you know, in your life, sometimes you make these, um, uh, these judgment calls on kind of a do or die situation. And the one thing I was not allowed to do at the time was I was not allowed to say that it was made by Davidoff. Right. Right. And I, at that time, you know, people were still faxing back then, but I put out a fax to like 3,500 people, like from the makers of Davidoff comes Occidental Reserve. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I still, I, I actually jokingly still get slapped about that um, from, from Hanky, you know, 20 years <laughs> later, but, <laughs> um, but I ended up, you know, I took, I took two cigars. I had enough money basically to buy samples. Um, I put two cigars in a silver tube with no price list. And we, we, we made, you know, and I sent them to 500 tobacconists and we followed up on the phone with 500 tobacconists and said, did you like this cigar? And what could you sell it for? And we basically at that time, I think the cigar was retailing for like $2 and 50 cents or $3. Mm -hmm. And they said, yeah, we can sell this for four or five. I said, well, if you could sell it for three, would you sell it? And we ended up with like 250 accounts overnight. Wow. And that, that's what kept us in business. Wow. And there are a couple of those moments of stuff that kept us in business, to be honest with you. Mm. It was, it was, it was close. It was hitting us for a long time. There was a point though, when you went back to Honduras and, and went to races Cubanas, when did that happen? That was in the, uh, kind of in the mid two thousands. Um, we had known of, uh, Ramayan Damano, who was the father and, he had a factory and we were doing some small things with him. We were doing Spirit of Cuba. We were working on some projects. And then that was, let's say 2004, 2005. And then we were going to launch Tempest back then. And we, we had seen this tobacco out of Trojas and we loved it. Uh, but the truth is Ramai wasn't ready for the production. The tobacco wasn't ready for the production. And I walked out of there you know, basically disappointed that we weren't going to be able to launch this line, but we waited. We waited for everything to be right. And then we launched, uh, 
we launched Tempest at the end of very end of 2006, beginning of 2007. And you got it out. You got you got it out right before the uh, grandfather day too. Yeah, yeah. We had hit just before, just uh, at the end of two thousand and six. Yeah. And how did you come about finding racist Cubanas? How did you kind of because at the time I'm gonna was that a very well known factory? I mean, we know of it now, but at the time, how many many people knew about it? Very few, but it happened to be that Ralph's connections in the cigar business at that time. You know, he was already ten or twelve years maybe in the business and. Uh, so he knew people down there and they were going through his uncle, uh, Pedro. They were, they were buying from the Placencias and, and sourcing tobacco. Uh, that was tropical tobacco at the time. Um, and so he knew, he knew Romai and Romai also lived and had a house in Miami. So they had a, they had a friendship and that's how it, that's how it started. Was, was Tempest the, do you consider that the Alec, the breakthrough cigar for Alec Bradley? The one that kind of really kind of put you on the map, or would you say it's something else? If I had to pick one, yeah, the Tempest. Yeah, I mean, there's some other things that happened. If you think about it, we had Occidental that kept us in business. Right. We did come up with Max, which were we were one of the very first companies to come out with all these large ring gauges. I was going to say that's a big innovation you guys had. And the other thing was we sold every size retails for five bucks. Yeah. Including the ego, which is like a nine and a quarter inch cigar. So I mean, everything would retail for five bucks, and uh, and then trilogy was also yeah. a big hit for us. And I mean, somebody tri- already mentioned the trilogy in the chat room. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I had in the notes as well. Um, you know, again, that was a very. I mean, you talk about innovation. That was a that was a triangular shaped mold you guys, I guess, put together with that. Yeah, that came from uh, me going to Home Depot and. Um, they were demoing a DeWalt table saw. And I'm like, hey, does that thing cut angles? And I went and bought wood and wood glue. And I had the guy cut angles and I came back. And I still own the press. I still have the original wow. triangle press mm-hmm. here. Yeah. What, what made Tempest special? What, what kind of made that cigar you think special? Without a question, it was the tobacco out of, uh, out of Trojas. Okay. I mean, no one, people may have been growing there, you know, prior, but nobody really understood the ability to take uh, like a seed like Criollo 98 and grow it there and what you could get out of it. And Romai just had a vision. And when we tasted that cigar, when we first did the blend and tasted that cigar, well, it was, we, Ralph and I kind of did that side look to one another where you don't have to say anything like, hmm, you know, and then we just said, this is something special. This is, this is unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, and you know when I think Trojas, I think I think Alec Bradley, that region. You know, I know there's a lot of great growing regions in in, in Honduras, but mm-hmm. Trojas is is I that's almost synonymous with Alec Bradley in my book. You know, today, I mean, you guys, I think, really put that on the map. And that was, you know, that was part of our goal as well, because people weren't talking about it. You know, they're talking about Hamastron, or if they're talking about Jalapa Valley, and they're talking about the well-known stuff. But it happens to be that Trojas is in the Jalapa Valley, but. Uh, this region was just very fertile. And and again, Romai was very focused on the tobacco from the very beginning. And we saw it, we just believed in it. And, uh, and I remember, I'll tell you a funny story. I remember being in New York, we were at a Davidoff location, the one on Columbus circle, and they had a little, a little smoking room in the back. And I think John, John Huber was there and I gave him a cigar and he looked at me, he's like, this is it. Yeah, you know, you know, you give it to your friends, you know, you give right. it to those guys that are that you that you trust and you, you appreciate. And uh, he's like, yeah, this is this is special. So, you know, you need those credibilities, you know, as a young maker, you want that. You know, I got to mention another cigar. And this, I think, was a, this was after Tempest, I know. Family Reserve, one of my all time, the original Family Reserves. Um, well, how did that project come about? Because that that's a that's a that was one of my favorites. I remember. So what happened was um, there was uh, George Sosa's father and Ralph's father and my father. And so we said, hey, why don't we just blend a cigar for the fathers? And um, it, it, we used to joke, you can get any size you want as long as it was a 50 by five and a half because it really made one size for them. And we really liked it. And we just wanted to give them a nice cigar that they could all smoke. And uh, we started giving it to our salespeople. And they said, hey, why don't we do this as an event-only cigar? And we, I said, well, that makes sense because I don't want to sell it unless someone does an event with us because they're kind of bringing, them, bringing us into their home. 
you know, if we do an event with them, it brings us into their family, into their home. And we started giving it away and it was unbanded. And people just kept saying, how do I get this cigar? And one thing led to another and we decided to bring it to market. The, the story with that cigar, I don't know if I told you this when we were in the office. I think I told Alec and Bradley this story. 2010, that was, that's when I got into cigar media. That was a cigar everyone thought was getting number one in 2010 from aficionado. It was like we were hearing this over and over. Like, not it wasn't going to be Bahike because Bahike we knew it was a, it was it was that cigar uh, we were all thinking about. It. And I remember because I'm like, yeah, this is a cigar I smoke a lot of. And I'm like, uh, it obviously didn't happen. Um, but yeah, that was that was one of the things floating around. I can tell you that. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story because it shows as much as you may think you know in the cigar business, how truly you end up knowing nothing is really what it comes down to. And I, so I happened to be in New York and I went up to cigar aficionado's offices. I remember sitting with Dave Savona at the time in his office. And I said, Hey Dave, I want to tell you about this cigar that we're coming out with. And I had, I had, uh, I had the family blend and I had, I think it was the Max Vice Press. And I was all pumped up about this Max Vice Press and I'm talking and I'm talking and I'm talking. And we get to the other cigar and he's like, like okay sl slow down <laughs> tell me about this other cigar and i'm like ah, it's just family blood you know and, and we had a little conversation and that was it so you know it's not like he let on like he liked it he just said tell me about it and next thing you know it, it you know scored very well and, and you know i was focused on the wrong cigar <laughs> right right <laughs> but you had another cigar i guess around that time that had started making its way out and that's prensado uh yeah. how, how did that project come about so we were having really great success with, with Tempest and we wanted to do somewhat of an iteration of that, uh, manipulating tobaccos and changing percentages and changing a little bit of it, the wrapper in itself. And I had not, uh, I had never come out with a box press before. And interestingly enough, Romai had never done a box press before, but he had an engineering background from Cuba. So um, we started looking at shapes and how to do it properly and, you know, the first one came out, there were like 90 degree angles, all very sharp. And I didn't like it. It wasn't comfortable. And it took us some time. And when we pressed it, we just really loved the blend and how it performed. And I said, why don't we, you know, Prensado is a term basically in our business or semi Prensado. And uh, I said, hey, I'm just going to call it Prensado. It's our box press. And next thing you know, we had the project, you know, uh, out to market. And um I don't know. Then good things started to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so another story is that that was the first leaked cigar aficionado number one cigar here. <laughs> that actually leaked out to the media the night before. Someone figured out how to access it. Really? So, yeah. So, like, uh, dead serious. We saw it. Like, there were there were links out there. That was before aficionado really. I guess they tightened it up or tried to tighten it up a lot more. But no, it's true. We we all saw it, saw it. We knew it was coming the next day. Did you have any inkling of that? I had none. Okay. I'll just tell I, you, it was out there, definitely. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you a story. So we, um, you know, that week, you know, if you're in the cigar business, obviously you'd love that accolade. And right. So I think it's like a Tuesday and, and 10, 9, 8 come out and I get to my office. And as soon as I walk in, there's like all these sad faces. I'm like, what happened? You know, I, someone got sick. I didn't know what was going on. They're like, we didn't get 10, 9 or 8. I'm like, that's, a, that's okay. And then, you know, the next day, Wednesday, 765 and Thursday, 432. And, uh, and I'm thinking to myself, man, I hope on Monday when 11 through 25 come out that we're in there. Cause it's still a great accolade to make top 25. Right. And, and, um, I think they, they refresh it, you know, or they hit it uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning. Right. And I was getting ready to leave. And my wife's like, you're not leaving. It's, you know, they're going to, they're going to announce something. And I said, that's exactly why I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I just want to, I don't want to think about it. I just want to get to the office and do my work. And, uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully Monday we, we have 11 through 25 and she's like, don't move. And, uh, I think Alec got his computer, his laptop, and he came to the, came to our bedroom, and all of a sudden he's like hitting the refresh button, and ten o'clock our band was there. I mean, it's, I can tell you, there's a numbness of feeling that comes over. Right. So, I was doing research before the show, and it was the first cigar out of Honduras to hit number one, like made in Honduras right. to hit the yeah. So that was a historic thing as well. And I think, I think he's still the only one, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think that's the case, but yes. in, in in addition, I'm also the first and only non-Hispanic 
or or either Cuban brand or non-Cuban or non-Latin family to ever first get gringo, first gringo, first gringo, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, first and only gringo as of right now. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, that's so yeah. I mean, but you know, it comes number one. You get you get all these accolades, and then you've been very, I'd say, transparent about how it was a double-edged sword. How you got number one with this? Talk a little about that. Yeah, so you know, you go you go through this um, through this period that that everything is happening faster than it's ever happened before, hmm. and with all the best intent, believe it or not, the problems that we had actually came off one sentence that I said at the factory that got a little bit misinterpreted, and that's I said we cannot have any cigars that are that are plugged. You know, the, we can't have any tight drawing cigars. And it ended up that they went in the other direction. And you know right. what I'm saying? They, right, they were too loose. They were too loose. They were too loose and they were soft. And, you know, we started to get some complaints. And you know, I said, well, wow, we're selling so many more, you know, so many more cigars right now that maybe the complaints are just commensurate with, you know, a handmade product type thing. And right. that wasn't the case. And, uh, you know, I had to do a lot of soul searching. I mean, it was, a, it was no doubt a very dark time in my life. So I let a lot of people down. I think that's what it was for me is that, you know, people entrusted you for that hour of their day and I let them down. And that was, that was a tough moment. Yeah. I remember reading the article that where you kind of discussed that and you were very open about uh, how everything happened and, you know, what this kind of state was from kind of beginning to end. And I just remember thinking like, this is probably the most honest anybody in the cigar business has ever been with the public. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's very tight lipped about things like that. And you know, people don't want to you know, maybe kind of admit to things or whatever it is. And I just felt like this is, this is different than other, than other scenarios that have happened. So it was just very, a refreshing moment to kind of read that and see somebody, you know, be very open and, you know, under, understand that, you know, the public has a perception, but then when you, you know, somebody, when somebody can admit to something, it, it's, a, it's a, just a big, uh, a big forgiveness that can happen from that rather than just kind of tr trying to like sweep it under the rug and move along. So I, I applaud you for doing that. Thank you. I, I can tell you yep. that um, I would say almost everybody, 98% of the people that I spoke to about wanting to do that, talked me out of it, tried to mm -hmm. talk me out of it. And I had to do it not only for the consumers that believed in us, but the consumers that still never abandoned us even through those times. And I thought it was the right thing to do, but I, I have to, I will tell you this, even though I, I'm not sure if, if I'm supposed to, but I will tell you this. And that was, <laughs> you know, I called, I called Dave Savona, you know, you call an, a, a, an international publication. Right. And I go, Hey, you know, uh, I think there's an article you should do and it's on me. <laughs> you know, it's really yeah. not like the thing to do. And uh, he said, well, just tell me what you're talking about. And, um, and I did, and he's like, are you sure, are you sure that's, you know, you really want to come out and, right. and be that open? And I said, Dave, if you ask the questions, I'll answer. And I'll answer every one of them. And uh, I ended up coming up, you know, later on in the year and spoke to him and I was nervous. I, I walked like, uh, I walked like four and a half blocks on a cool day and it looked like I jumped in a pool by the time I got to his office. I mean, I was, I was, you know, nerves uh, all over the place, so. That's how Coop was all day today. That's how I was today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, God, I, 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 very true. <laughs> you, if you saw, like, uh, oh, the only bear who's the thir third co-host has actually seen me in that mode, uh, and it was actually when we were down in the DR interview in Hanky, I was the same way. Uh, uh, yeah. Hanky, I get it, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> That guy, that guy is iconic. He's a, he's such a gentleman. He's an amazing guy. Listen, you're iconic too, uh, and I and I mean that in a sincere way. Uh, I mean, like I said, um, so definitely. Um, yeah. So I mean, and I and I agree with Aaron. That was uh, it was so refreshing to see that, and um, you know, I just it, like I said, just I think a lot of people in this industry, you know, they know it's a handmade product, and I think they they rooted for you guys in that. I mean, there was no one who said everyone was so positive. I remember when when that article came out that I talked to whether they were in the industry or just a casual smoker, it was just, I think it went, it was just honest. And that's, that's, I think what, what it spoke to is, is what it comes down to. Yeah. You know, uh, again, it, maybe it was selfish in the fact that I did it because I did it for me in, in some way, because I had to get this off my chest. And I can tell you when I walked out, 
when I walked out of that office, when, when the interview was over. And again, you don't know how it's going to be written necessarily. I right. Answered questions. I felt, I felt like a hundred pounds lighter. You know, I felt like this weight was off my shoulder. I bared my soul. I can tell you, I cried during the interview. I laughed during the interview as well, but you know, going and rehashing everything that I did. And it was no malintent on the factory's part. They no. just wanted to, they were trying to keep up with productions and, and I was really called all over the place. You know, I was called by the Honduran consulate to do a dinner. Uh, I was, I had let a lot of people to back in this down because, you know, personal relationships. When a guy called me two, three weeks later and said, Hey, I need 25 boxes of your number one cigar. And I'm like, hey, hey, if you had called five minutes after, you know, the announcement, I couldn't have given you that. Right. And he's like, well, you've changed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But, you know, but uh, there were people who had expectations. And so, the, you know, again, you learn. Uh, and we've made, we've made substantial changes. Um, we've learned under, to understand in productions and as we've grown, um, how to put more processes in place for quality control and what we're looking for and the amount of supervisors we need and where we need them. I mean, we, we revamped basically from the seed all the way up from that time. It made, it made, it made us better scar manufacturers. I can tell you that. Right. Very true. And, and I think it showed Alan with, um, cause there was a lot of good products coming out post Prensado. I mean, the one I'm this, you launched shortly after that, the, the fine and rare series, um, which I'm smoking the 2005 edition right now. Um, 10 tobaccos in there. Uh, it, it became a very, and I remember when the first fine and rares came out, um, they, they were kind of like, they were kind of those, for lack of a better term, they were unicorns. We were all chasing those down that year. Um, and it's just something every year to look forward to as well. How did that project come about? Yeah, that was a good one. Um, you know, when you're blending, and you can ask any, any brand owner or manufacturer who's blending, there's always a give and take, right? You're going to add something, you're going to remove something, you're creating balance, you're creating complexities and flavors or whatever you're trying to create at that time with that product. And somehow or another, we just kept adding. We just kept adding. And so what we had to do was figure out how to cut the most flavorful part of each tobacco to the right size and right percentage to be able to get 10 tobaccos or, you know, you'd be smoking a, a, a baseball bat. Right. So, <laughs> you know, ultimately, so, uh, and it was, and it was, and, and then they, they, you know, I was with, I was with, uh, Ugo and Alex, who's his uh, main supervisor. And he basically turned and said, now we don't want to make it because it's too difficult to have all those different tobaccos. And I said, well, at this point, it's not your choice. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, I'm I'm in love with it, and we're going to do it. And we picked uh, we picked the best pair of of rollers to roll the production. And it's been a fun series. I mean, from from someone like me, because I look forward to the different releases every year, the different blends. And then when you've brought back the blends in a different vintage, that's been fun too to compare and contrast them. So, from my point of view, that that's always been a fun series to smoke every year. Um, and this is this is a four year aged one right now, and um, this one aged really well. This one actually aged really well. This 2005 one. Well, it, and and prior to getting on uh, prior to getting on the show, when we talked a little bit, I, I told you that uh, that I had smoked one from 2016 last month that I happened to have in, in the bottom of a humidor, and it was really a nice hour and a half for me. Uh, I mean, I I enjoy it, and and I actually think our 20 our 2016 version is still one of the best that we've done, and we you know we use different combination of tobaccos, but. Uh, I think 16 to 17 were, were good years. Yeah. They, like I said, the, I remember the 16 was very good. Um, I did enjoy it. That was, was that the third release of the first blend? Really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to remember. Well, you, maybe you tell me. Uh, I, I don't <laughs> uh, no, no, it's a, uh, I'll have to fact check that one. <laughs> uh, but, um, all right. Well, I'm fact checking that one, um, okay. <laughs> which I will. Let's go talk about the. Um, there was another release that came out. I think it was right around Prensado, uh getting number one. Was and this I think became a really big hit for you guys. Uh, was Black Market? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the story. It's interesting because it's somehow there is a story behind almost every you know thing that we're doing. But 
uh, I remember Ralph and I were down in, in Honduras and uh, we had been working with Panamanian tobacco for like two years trying to get, just every time we went down, we worked with the Panamanian tobacco to try and put a blend together. And I remember we were sitting down and we did the month before we had asked, we basically worked out 18 iterations using Panamanian tobacco. So needless to say, my, my day was going to be full, right? Because we had to get through at least smoking some of most of those blends that day. And, uh, but black market was, we weren't down there for black market. Right. We, were down, we were down there for another project we were doing. And I remember Ralph was on the computer, but every time Ralph and I are smoking blends, we smoked the same blend at the same time. Mm. So that way, if there's a question or what do you think, or are you getting this note out of it? We're on the same page. And, uh, we got to the third blend, the third iteration. And I turned to him and I'm like, uh, this is black market. And he kind of just looked at me like I'm an idiot. And he's like, <laughs> black market. I mean, we're not here for black market. And I said, yeah, I, I didn't pick it. It told me this is black market. Um, and that night till with bad, with bad internet in Honduras, I was sending pictures of crates to our creative director at the time, like all these different crates and what I wanted it to like four 30 in the morning. And he woke up to like 70 emails. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, what are these crates that you're sending me? And I, and I explained the whole deal and we developed black market and today it's our, it's our number one selling. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. I think I would, that. Uh, I know, like I said, I thought that might be the number one seller. I was going to ask you that. Yeah, volume-wise, that's our number one seller. Mm -hmm. By the way, the uh, the 2016 was the third issue of the uh, HJ10 4 blend. So, <laughs> so I did get that right. Yeah. <laughs> better, better that one of us got it right. It wasn't <laughs> I, I had to look it up on Coop, actually. I had to go up and look that up. <laughs> so I didn't have that. But I, was, I thought it was that first blend. That was that was that year, and I do, and I'm going to talk about 2016 because I remember that year distinctly in a minute. Um, you also, the other thing, obviously, a huge. Uh, I remember I was at the trade show. I, was, I went over to the Palms that day. The uh, the Mundial, the Mundial launched into space. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but great cigar on top. I mean, I still I still love that cigar. Uh, that was a that was another nice cigar. It got you a nice rating in aficionado as well. It did. And I mean, to this day, I, I probably smoke one or two Mundials a week. Uh, I'm, you know, depending on my time, I stick to the smaller ones. The, That's what the, I like. The small ones are really good. Yeah. The Punta Lanza number four and number five, I kind of stick there, but uh, I like that cigar. I think it's got, it's got kind of a nice zest to it. It's got a little bit, you know, it's got that, that a little bit of that power straight through the nose. So I, I like that cigar a lot. I, I got to know Johnny, uh, that year too i had gone into uh smoke on the water and i got to know him and I, I remember you guys launched the thing into space and how did that all come about because he actually was telling me the story he was the guy who went and retrieved i guess the unit out in the desert <laughs> he was telling me the story yeah, of that yeah yeah we put him in a car and sent him like go into the desert for three hours and see if you <laughs> find find thing. Find thing, yeah <laughs> yeah we um yeah we just wanted to do something that was different something that was cool and you know a friend of mine uh phil maloof uh as the penthouse out there at the palms and we launched it off his deck and uh, we hired a company out of California, these young guys that came out and, you know, it was just, you know, basically one of those giant weather balloons and it just took it up and had a GPS, had GPS trackers on it. Uh, it had a GoPro on it and uh, we, we launched it. It was cool. It was just something cool to do. Actually, a couple of people in the office had pictures of it with the ice crystals forming between the cigars and the, and the acrylic case. Right. Yeah, I found the video. I actually found the video because uh, I'm writing a series of retrospectives on the 2013 IPCR, and I actually found the video for that. It's still out on YouTube. In that humidor behind me right there is the original cigars that were in the acrylic case. So, so, has anyone sm so no one smoked those cigars. They've just uh, – so we don't know the effects of the cigars in the stratosphere, basically. <laughs> One day in the next 10 years, uh, we'll, we'll do something probably with a charity. That's great. That's great to hear. That was great to hear on that. Um, you know, so um, let me just see here. Aaron, did you have anything else on, on some of these releases? Mm, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, so I mentioned, um, I mentioned going back to 2016, right? And I, I distinctly remember that trade show uh, very, very well. At the time, I think Clay was with you guys. Mm -hmm. um, and... No, it wasn't. It wasn't. Was it Clay? Sam. Maybe it was Clay. Wait, it was. But Sam. I remember Sam. Yeah. But yeah. at 2016, this was the whole 
FDA doomsday scenario that was coming out. Um, and we all thought it was the end of the cigar industry. Like, well, I didn't think it was, but there were people who felt it was going to be the end of the cigar industry. We saw everyone throwing releases out, but the kitchen sink. You go over to the Alec Bradley booth. You guys made a decision to, I remember that year, you didn't really launch anything new but the fine and rare year, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we did, we had prepared ourselves um, uh, and did everything that we needed to by, by what the FDA's you know, uh, codes were that we needed. So we did everything that we needed to do. Uh, I think that was the year, it was the only year in 32 years that Ralph Montero was not at that show. And the reason was, is he was down at the factory so we could get all the releases out, get everything done that we needed to get. Um, it was a, it was a pretty trying time in the industry, but we knew that we had prepared properly to be able to, to sustain ourselves. So what were you telling customers that year saying, okay, cause there were, I guess there were retailers who thought this may be the end of the world and you guys have nothing new with the show. How did you kind of, what was kind of, what were you doing that year to kind of keep your retailers at ease? Hey, Alec Browley is going to be around for a long time. Believe it or not, if you looked at the graphics, if you're able to find graphics from that year on our booth, basically we stated in every bit of our graphics that we are going to be here today and we will be here 10 years from today. And here's why. And we printed it and our booth was covered. Yep, in that's all true. Things that, that we are here, we have prepared and we will be around. Yeah, that I do now. I need to say I do remember that now. Yeah. Kind of moving forward again, um, the next thing I think maybe along the timeline, and if I'm missing anything, let me know. Uh, this was now, – now you're starting to bring your sons into the business right now. Um, was that something that you kind of prodded them saying, hey, guys, why don't you come into business? Or did they come to you and say, hey, we want to be a part of, of what you're doing? Yeah, for sure I didn't prod them to come into the business. I can tell you. I mean, I, I, I actually – said to him, Hey, if you guys want to go into the insurance business, I think that's a great idea because everyone needs insurance, but right. <laughs> nobody needs cigars. I said, but on the other side of that, nobody wants insurance and people want cigars. So you have to decide if you want to sell a need or a want. And it, it, they, they gravitated to it. I mean, what I told them was cigars are my passion. It's the business I'm in. You need to find what wants you to, you know, what you, what makes you want to get up in the morning and go to work every day. And Alec, you know, it happens to be that both my kids from the time they were young uh, used to come in, work in the warehouse uh, when they were, you know, young kids during the summer, like I did with my father. And then I would have them sit in on meetings. They used to call them, Alec used to call them shut up meetings. <laughs> We'd have to go in and just shut up and, uh, you know, like not say anything. But whether I was meeting with the insurance company, when I was meeting with the bankers, when we were meeting with our tobacco suppliers, he would just sit in. So both the kids really learned how to deal with adults. I didn't know what business, you know, uh, Alec is three years older than Brad. So Alec has, had come into the business first while Bradley was still going to college. And, um, and they just, they just gravitated here. They know it's a very social business. And I think they, they both like that and appreciate that part of it. There are great relationships that are had, had out of this industry and they started to gain their own relationships at a very young age and they decided on their own to come yeah, you know, I, I think when they came in, there was almost like, and don't take this the wrong way, I think there was almost a change in Alec Bradley that we saw in, as a company in that you, you, you had a little bit of this use infusion. And I think you could certainly put John Lipson in that category as well, mm -hmm. where there was more of a, of a use infusion where I remember when, when Aaron and I talked with Alec and Bradley, how they just smoked a lot of stuff that a lot of us smoke, right? And we, mm -hmm. we were learning that these guys were chasing down cigars and stuff like that in my opinion, that had a very positive addition to what you were already had built at Alec Bradley. I think it started to open up a lot more doors with that. Uh, I agree a hundred percent. So one of the things that I didn't do was I didn't pigeonhole the boys and say, you're going to go into accounting part of the business or you're going to go into sales or you're going to go into marketing. I basically just had them sit down and try and learn all the aspects of the business and figure out where their strengths were and let them go there, which is what's happening still today. But yeah, they, I'll tell you what it did for me personally. Okay. Bringing them in renewed my energy in this business because I realized that if they're going to be second generation cigar makers, that the foundation I 
provide for them has to be strong. Right. And so it came down that I started to really get back into the business and looking at every little detail, not only from the tobacco side, which I've always done, or let's say the branding side, which I've always done, but also on the internal workings and operations of the business. And I had a lot of cleaning up to do, but I was renewed. I mean, my energy was back and, you know, I get to be a part of my kids' careers every day. Not everyone has the opportunity to, to say that. So I, I take that, you know, I don't take that lightly. I worked for my father one summer. It was the toughest summer I ever worked. Uh, uh, I drove. I drove his. I drove his uh, livery cars. So now uh, you know what my kids go through. By the way, uh, yeah, believe yeah, believe me. My my father was like, uh, he's a stubborn guy too. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. If yeah. I if I didn't bring that car back cleaner than how I got it, I was like gonna get raked over the coals. I mean, that was it was the truth too. Yeah, no, yeah. It's, and I'm the same. I mean, I, yeah. I try and use every day as a, as a teaching opportunity. Yeah, yeah. No, and, I, you know, it, it's, a, it's a balancing act between being the dad and being the boss. So did, not easy. Did, and was the plan originally for them to become star, cigar makers, or did they come to you saying, hey, we want to start becoming our own cigar makers in themselves? Uh, I don't know if I even really told them initially, but it was, it was my plan, is that if they were going to be in the business – they had to feel some of the same struggles that I did. So I, you know, once they were in it and they were learning it and they smoke a lot of cigars, as you guys know, right. They smoke a, a lot of other brands and a lot of other manufacturers uh, because they're, they're cigar smokers. I mean, forget that they're in the business. If they weren't in the business, they'd still be doing that same thing. And, and so I said, look, I think the, the way to do this properly is you guys create your own brand. You invest your own money in the brand. Mm -hmm. And if it works, you make more. And if it doesn't work, you lose your investment, which is real business. And uh, it's all going to depend on what you put in at the beginning. And once you have the cigar, what you do from that point forward. And they, they took the challenge. I yeah, remember them sharing that story about, you, you know, you let them know they had to do the investment in order to make that happen. So and I, I think that's an important thing to do. Um, when, when they are, uh, you know, putting blends together and, and testing things out. What's your kind of thought process on, on how much information that you want to share with them in regards to what your thoughts are on the cigars? Uh, that, uh, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> so uh, on their first launch, which was a limited release, um, which was Blind Faith, the reason it was a limited release was I couldn't just give them experienced rollers without hurting my own production. Right. So we had to give them a certain amount that we could afford to give them. And I said, hey, let's create a plan. And they created the plan. It was their, it was their brand name. It was their blend. Um, it, it, the whole concept was completely theirs from beginning to end. And I, I remember when they came to me and said, Dad, we're down between two blends. We want your opinion. And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> I said, there's no way. I said you guys decide on the blend that I'll smoke them and I'll make my own decision, but you're not going to know until you guys pick the blend that you want. And we were on the same blend. Nice. So, yeah. I had, I had one piece of, uh, <laughs> this is the funniest thing. I had one, one piece that I added to their first release. And if you look at the artwork, the guys, it's a blue suit, right? right. With the television head. I asked them to make the tie brown instead of blue. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's, That's it. What, uh, I'm the big retro. They, they fought me on that. that <laughs> no, you made the right call. I'm the retro guy here. Yeah, brown ties are cool. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. I mean, I was growing up in the 80s. Reagan wore the brown ties, and I remember wearing brown ties to work when I got out of college. So it was. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you know, I remember when that cigar came out, Craig Cass had gotten like a, an early release of that, and he gave me one of these cigars, right? Craig Cass to the Tinderbox, and he's mm -hmm. like, well, tell me what you think of this. I'm like, this thing is like a powerhouse. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like is this, is, is, are you sure this is Alec Browley? He's like, yeah. He goes, this is the boys who are doing this. I'm like, wow. I mean, I, I was completely thrown off track how strong that cigar was um, at the time for you guys because I'm used to your profile. Yeah, you know, they – they wanted to come out with a blend that spoke to them and spoke to their audience. And they w did not want to do something that was Alec Bradley esque in its style. And, uh, and I was all about it. I mean, the one thing I promised them and, and promised myself is that I would not get in the way of decisions that they wanted to make. 
So then with Gatekeeper, that's kind of something, again, um, they go back to the Dominican Republic. Um, you, you know, they work with – this. you've worked with a lot of key partners over the years. Um, but you know, they go to Ernesto. Did they come to you and say, hey, we want to do this cigar with Ernesto? Yeah, so um, I, I can tell you that Alec and Bradley both, and I think more specifically Alec, but they, they both said, you know, when number one was coming out, like two or three weeks before, they're like, Ernesto's getting number one this year. And they picked <laughs> the cigar. And it's interesting because Ernesto and I have a, a great relationship for a lot of years. Um, right. And I mean, a, a true friendship. And Ernesto had gained his own relationship with Alec and Bradley. And we own the trademark collaboration. And I thought we were going to do something under the trademark collaboration. And they said, hey, we want to do a collaboration with Ernesto, but we're going to come up with our own concept. And, and they did. And Ernesto was all about it. And they went down to the, you know, down to the DR. They worked on the blends with him. It was truly a collaboration. Many times a cigar manufacturer will give four or five blends and say, hey, pick one that you like. And they, they didn't do that. They went down and were very intricately involved in, in the blending. So. And, and, that, and Alan, I can tell you it was one of the cigars everyone was talking about at the trade show this year. Mm-hmm. I mean, well, it, really, it really was. That's, that's good to hear. I mean, yeah. I, can, I can tell you we, we, sold out, we sold out of the first production, and I believe most, if not all, of the second production that was scheduled on that cigar. So they did their job in getting out and promoting it. Um, I think the blend is spectacular. It's what I'm smoking now. Um, I think Ernesto did a, a great job. And when we went down, we went down right before the trade show. Uh, Bradley and I went down uh, mid-June just to smoke off the production before anything hit the boxes. And I'm quite impressed with, with what the production came out, how it came out. And it was so different, not just for you. And I think a lot of us commented it was so different for what Ernesto did too. There mm-hmm. was, it was, you know, Ernesto has, has a profile as well, but, but that just seemed like you guys went to a, a, a white space that, that neither had. And it, well, I thought that, I think that was a real positive with that. Well, it, it's interesting because first of all, it has this, Will. I remember you telling me that. Yeah. I remember you telling me. We were, we were talking about this. I think we were talking about this up at the uh, penthouse. Yeah. Yeah. And so I remember you telling me that, and I, which I find interesting but I agree with you. And, and I think that was, you know, you have this interesting thing, right? You have this iconic cigar maker, uh, a, a, you know, uh, a, a, an older guy, uh, Cuban descent. You have these two young cigar makers and they have nothing in common other than the cigar, other than the passion of the cigar on that level. So Alec and Bradley added their influence and Ernesto added his influence and together they came out with this blend and, uh, so far it's home run yeah. now there's I've also just in general as a company despite this, aside from the Alec and Bradley brands right I've seen you as a company in the last year you guys have, have been putting out some releases that I would say are a little bit different than you've put out in the past and, I, and the two I'm really talking about are Magic Toast and Project 40 uh, which those those again I know they seem very different than what I've seen out of Alec Bradley over the past few years as well yeah. Um, yeah, Magic Toast. Um, Magic Toast had to do with, you know, a specific tobacco that we had seen that we loved. And it was, it was a, a bit of a translation issue, but that's how that came about. And uh, we just wanted to do something cool with it, something we hadn't done before. And the, one of the things that I didn't want to do and I never want to do is just get stuck in a path that is, oh, that's Alec Bradley and not be able to be creative. And so I like the creative part of this business and I still want to be able to do that. And so that's uh, magic toes was an opportunity. Um, and then project 40 was actually because in our portfolio, we didn't have anything that hit that profile and that price point. And if you look back at what project 40 is basically is that a hundred percent of your happiness is broken up into 50% is genetic and 10% is environmental and the other 40% you control and looking at that study had to do with the fact that if you think about why food or spirits or, or wine or music touches certain senses and makes you feel a certain way. And I felt cigars do that same thing. And so we used that's project 40 mentality uh, behind the blend, behind the brand. Yeah. And I mean, you, you worked with Jesus Fuego on that blend. We did. Yeah. We did. I, I mean, so there was definitely, I mean, I got, and I, I saw the half wheel rating. I could tell you that's a real, that was a real sleeper 
cigar this year is what I'm going to just tell folks. Uh, you need to try that cigar. Uh, I agree. That's a very good cigar. Yeah. And, and Jesus is one of our kind of our new partners. Um, you know, again, it, it all comes down to long, long time relationships. Uh, Jesus and I go back a, a very long way when he was still working back for Rocky many years ago before he started his own business. And um, when Jesus first came to the States, he came to our office and we showed him how to set up an office and how to set up a warehouse and, you know, as a friend. And, uh, you know, years later now we're, we're partnering up on stuff. So. That's great. Yeah. Aaron, anything else on these releases or uh, hit the, uh, go ahead and move on to the next one. Yep. Yeah. So, um, Lars Tetons. So that was, that caught everyone by surprise this year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it caught everyone by surprise. And I think it caught everyone by surprise about the products that were released too, because I think it surprised a lot of us. I know when we were at the media party that night, how did that whole thing, what made you kind of say, let's, let's try to resurrect Lars Tetons. Well, first of all, I've been, a, I've been a fan of Lars for a long time. Uh, I mean, by far the most creative person in the industry, to my knowledge, you know, this is a guy who, makes skateboards that are collectible. Uh, the guy is an accomplished chef. I know firsthand because he's, he's cooked for me. Oh, that, that, that's it. Go. Let um, me tell you, but you got to get this, folks. You got to get this seasoned salt. <laughs> yeah, his, <laughs> his spices are crazy. Yeah, they are. They really are. If I open this up right here, there's a whole bunch of spices there too. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I use them every day. But it really does. It's really good. Yeah, I mean, he, you know, if he wants music, he creates it himself. The guy right. is amazing. He's did you see his leather goods? Yes. It's, you know, it's like designer quality leather goods. I mean, yeah. the, guy's, the guy's incredible, but I've always been a fan and we've always had a friendship. And I just approached him one day and said, you know, I think we could do something together. Um, it's hard to get creatives to settle down and be business people. Right. Right. You know, ultimately their brain doesn't always work that way. And I just felt in combination with, our ability to do business and how people have accepted, you know, accepted our company and our brand that we could do something great with this line. And, um, but the guy has been very, very involved from the blends that we did to how he conditions the cigars, uh, the, the botanicals, the exotic, uh, uh, oils that we have to use all the, you know, all the essential oils and thick. I mean, let me tell you, not only did we, by the company, but the investment we had to make <laughs> in, in, in those components was substantial. So, uh, but again, uh, you know, we only, we only released really two lines, right? And that was Gatekeeper from Alec and Bradley and the Lars line. Alec right. Bradley as a company ourselves did not have a release at the show. Yeah. It was actually a comment on a very, the project 40 was actually before the show. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And, uh, and we sold out, we sold out the Lars production and we sold out the gatekeeper production, which is what the intent was. So, so why go, why, why take this risk with Lars Teton with, 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 I'd say, let's say conditioned cigars falling into the category of maybe being under the microscope of the FDA. Uh, we knew that going in and, mm -hmm. and when Lars and I put the deal together, we actually did it with a potential two year timeline. And that we were going to do everything we could in the next, you know, couple of years. And if we couldn't do it anymore, we gave it our best run. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a very popular market. We weren't in it. It didn't take away from anything we did. It didn't cannibalize anything we did. And I thought it was a great addition. And, and one of the reasons I actually did it as well was we have a, an amazing group of territory managers out on the road every day. And I thought, man, if we could give them something in addition to sell that doesn't take away from what they currently do, that it's a home run for everybody. Um, and Lars really bought in, trusted me. Uh, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, he wanted to be in a family atmosphere. We provided that. And uh, we're running it like, a, like the business it needs to be. And people have been very accepting of it. And go ahead, Baron. Did anybody try to talk you out of it? <laughs> yeah. The, I, I couldn't, if we, if we took the rest of the hour going down the list of people <laughs> who tried to talk me out of it. It wouldn't be enough time. Right. But I already knew, I already knew what I wanted. And the truth is I wanted to be associated with Lars. Mm. At the end of the day, I wanted to be associated with Lars because he has a creativity I could never imagine to have myself. Right. And I just appreciated that. And if he was able to trust in me that we would do the right thing by the brand, then it was, it was, it, it couldn't not work. We knew 
that there's a potential timeline on this. But we struck the deal based on that. So, Alan, when we were at the party, you challenged me a bit in terms of how come I didn't have Lars Tetons as one of my hottest things, right? Mm-hmm. And, and and here was my answer back to you, and I just want to kind of comment a little more on it. Um, I think you guys have some work to do as far as this was something that's – I think it's something that can work. Don't mm-hmm. get me wrong. I think it's something that can work. I think you guys have it. But I think you guys are going to have some work because this is going to be a different – this is not – these cigars are not – XYZ flavored, XYZ infused. Correct. It's a different. It's a different thing. So that I just want to leave. That was where my comment came on that. It wasn't so much that. And actually, I was very pleasantly surprised what these cigars brought to the table. And I think a lot of us were that night. Yeah. Look, we we had worked. Let me start and say this: If you took the conditioning process, which is this multi-step conditioning process, it's very labor intensive. But if you took that away, the cigar blend itself. The blends themselves are great. And so now you add this process and Lars was very exacting on this thing. It was like, it's like a mad scientist in the white jacket and the goggles. And, right. you know, like this guy is, he's a, he's a perfectionist. And all of a sudden we started, we started smoking it, you know, there and we were just blown away. And I'll tell you something that was interesting. We were sitting in a small room. Um, Lars had walked out. It was, it was Ralph and his just fuego and I, and they were smoking cigars and I lit up one of the Lars and no one really, I knew it. I tasted it and I had the aromatics off of it, but Ralph and Jesus didn't know I was smoking a Lars Eaton. So I got everything out of it, but it wasn't offensive to anyone else in the room. And I thought that I'm like, this is a selling point. Yeah. This is, I, this is something I didn't know was going to happen. And they were also different. They were all, they were also different, the cigars. Yeah. You know, it's funny. He has a line in, in, you know, it's the most expensive line that we've ever sold. I mean, it's $50 a cigar. And someone had asked me, why is it $50 a cigar? And I said, because one of the, the, the components of this concoction that he does was $36,000 a quart. Wow. For one of the essential wow. Oil. Yeah. Wow. I'm like, I'm like to the guy, can I buy like a thimble of work? Right. <laughs> Try it out first. <laughs> Try it out. <laughs> It was, you know, it's a big investment, but, but I mean, the cigars are incredible. What I find the most interesting is that there's a lot of traditional style cigar smokers here in my office and they're smoking large. Yeah. So that's a good sign. Yeah. I know Jack, who's one of your reps, uh, came from the media and he was like, he, he was smoking them and he's like, and he's, he was, yeah, he goes, I'm really digging these. He's going. Yeah. And Jack's, Jack's a fairly new hire for us, man. He's a great guy. Yeah. He's going he's gonna to do exceptionally well. Yep. No, uh, I, I, uh, I saw him hanging out in Vegas at that draft party. I said, you got to get me to that draft party next year. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, no, I mean, so I, and the other thing I found about, and we're going to have Lars on the show in October, by the way. Mm-hmm. So, uh, we're going to be talking a lot to Lars about that, but I found Lars to be, I always thought he was a recluse, I guess, cause maybe he had been gone for so long. Right. Mm-hmm. And we hadn't heard from him, but I, I, when we were at that party and when we were at the booth, I found him very engaging. I was, I was very surprised about that. You know, the one thing, and again, he, he did kind of remove himself out of the cigar business for a period of time. His cigars were always in the market. Right. But he wasn't always available, you know, to be doing events and those things. But he had focused on his leather line and his spice line. And he does, uh, he does some CBD stuff with some celebrities and, and things of that nature. And uh, I just thought it was time to come back. But the truth is, the guy's got amazing energy. He's got... He's, he's accessible. He's a, he's a regular person. He's definitely eccentric in that way, but he's just got great energy. Uh, and he walks into the room and he lights up a room. Yeah. And we, like I said, we saw a synergy with you guys definitely at that party that night um, where, you know, cause you guys are they're different. They're different. You guys come from two different backgrounds. And then that was, there was a great synergy. I thought that night. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it felt good. And, and Laura's got to, it, it's funny. I think a lot of people, expressed the same sentiment to me that you did. And that is, wow, like Lars is a real person. And, and, you know, I had a great conversation with him and he was fun. He's always smiling. Yeah. He's always in a good mood. And, uh, he's just, he's just loving the whole thing right now. That's, that's great. Aaron, anything on Lars Tetons we want to hit still? Whose idea was it to come up with the, uh, Lars closet in the booth at the trade show? <laughs> I really – wait, can I find out if you liked it first before I take yeah, it? Yeah, I think it was great. I just, yeah, we I, thought it was great. We thought it was great. 
Yeah. So I think somebody on social media posted like, you know, like talking about like kind of like a, you know, hypothetical like a boardroom meeting where like, let's create this room and let's put this and this in there and let's have Lars in there. And like, you know, who, who signed off on, on this little, on this little project. So it's funny you say that because Lars, who is the creative, the last thing I want to do is get in the way of what is in his brain. And, but, um, he was down and we were having a conversation and he's like, well, what do you want to do with the show? And, and I said, I'd like to create an atmosphere like your living room. Like when we hung out and had dinner where he's got the skateboards, the old vintage skateboards that he created lined up and he's got all these guitars and, um, and his artwork all over the place. And, and so I said, I want to get that feel cause it was such a kind of a homey feel to it. And I said, I think you'll be more comfortable as well. And he was like, yeah, I, I think we could do that. And we, you know, we, I kind of laid it all out for him and he loved it. And it, I don't know if when, did you, did you walk in? Did you see that back wall? Yeah. I, I didn't get a chance wall. to go. I did. Yeah, I did. Yeah. And so the back wall was, we took his artwork and we just made panels and we literally Velcroed them to all to the back wall and someone placed an order. He signed it and they went home with it and he loved it. And uh, it just worked. I, it gave him an opportunity to be him without just being out you know, on the floor. Right. Great. All right. One, one, before we get into some of the other topics, one, I have one last question. So there was a big change in your company right before IPCPR. Uh, George Sosa, longtime uh, VP of sales has, has left. Um, big void. What are the plans in terms of, is George going to be replaced? How, how are things going to like uh, transition with that? Well, first and foremost, let me, I'd like to actually say this publicly. First of all, I want to thank George. George, gave me 24 hours a day for 12 years. Okay. I mean, he was as loyal as they come. Uh, I remember when we started um, and, and how we were able to grow with George as our national sales manager. And I, I can't thank him enough for the time he gave me. Um, and now he's going to be in retail uh, out on the West coast of Florida. Uh, he's with uh, Art Toll. And it's, it's, it's funny because it's too, older experienced funny guys you know together in the room it's going to be like a sitcom uh, right. over there but <laughs> i think george is you know going to be a little more relaxed he doesn't he spent so much time on the road you know 12 years of may uh 10 or 12 years in the cigar business before that he's a uh retired former uh, navy master chief so he gave 20 years plus to the military and it was just you know we were heading in a little bit different directions i just couldn't ask him to start to be more analytical and looking at certain things. And it was just, it was just time, but uh, truly can't thank him enough for, for everything he did for our company. So uh, in terms of uh, replacing him, I mean, ultimately we want to, we do want to bring somebody in and we will bring somebody in, whether it's within our company or somebody outside, or maybe even outside the industry to come in and be able to put programs together. So we become, more customer centric, uh, better partners to our retailers. Uh, and we're, we're looking, we're going to start looking. We haven't really looked yet. This was not about replacing George. Mm -hmm. This was about knowing that we were going to be heading in a little bit different direction in the near future. And so we're going to, we're going to look for somebody for sure. That's great. Yeah, that's great. All right. Why don't we get into what we're smoking here real quick. And that's sponsored by Tailored Smoke, located in the heart of downtown Charlotte's Epicenter. Tailored Smoke is your one-stop shop for a tailored smoke experience. Aaron, what did you light up tonight? So I started with, uh, with Gatekeeper uh -huh. uh, in a Robusto. Um, and then I'm smoking now the Tempest Natural in, um, in a, the Genesis size, uh, a little Corona. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Aaron, how about you? Uh, I lit up the uh, Nika Puro Diamond Rough Cut. Uh, it's the first time I've smoked the cigar. I was a little uh, unsure of how the mouthfeel was going to be on the cigar, mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's fairly comfortable. Um, there's no, it's not anything that's drastic uh, at the head, um, so it that works out. It's not like a, a large ring gauge cigar or anything like that where you're struggling to kind of get the draws right. Um, but the cigar is fantastic. I mean, uh, the really nice wood. Um, baking spice, black pepper centric, uh, but it's smooth. Uh, retro hills easily. It's not uh, overpowering in regards to strength. Um, so it's, uh, you know, for the first time smoking, I think it's a, it's a pretty good cigar. I'm, I'm glad you got your hands on it. Cause we only released that once a year and it sells out uh, it, prior to being delivered uh, before yeah, it's it was, sold and gone. 
I was able to get my hands on one when we came into the office. So I was uh, <laughs> thanks, thankful for uh, the generosity there. That's awesome. <laughs> there, you, there you go. I remember, I remember, yeah, I remember that one. You would just step for the samples, Aaron, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm, well. I'm smoking the uh, Fine and Rare, the 2015 edition. Um, you know, this is four years old. So I was wondering maybe the tobaccos would get a little muddled after the time. It would lose it. Actually, I'm finding a very well-balanced cigar. I'm, I'm getting really some of those rich Honduran uh, tobacco flavors in, in here that's really nice. Not overly sweet, not overly spicy, so it's right in my wheelhouse. I'd say it's smoking at a, at a medium level. Uh, combustion is perfect. Um, and the 15 was always, I actually bought a box of the 15s. So I had, uh, I think I have a couple still left in my humidor of these. Uh, very, very good cigar. Uh, like I said, the fine and rare is something I look forward to every year. And it's kind of fun to kind of go back and, and smoke some of these, see how they're smoking after a few years. So I was glad to pull this one out. Yeah, we have a, uh, we are released coming out at the end of this year. Um, I don't want to talk about it too much now, but you'll see it when it hits. It's it, this one is out of all the finer rares. This one I think for me is for sure the most special. Come oh, that's great. That's, yeah. great! that's great! That's great. Eleven say, tobaccos. It, <laughs> Ten and a half. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. So that's what we're smoking tonight. Um, so what I want to do is I'll uh, just do another sponsor break and then Alan will get into some of the industry stuff. Uh, that I know you've been chomping at the bit to talk about. <laughs> yeah. All right. Great. Uh, first up, the authentic Corojo leaf is one of the most robust and flavorful leaves out there. During the golden age of cigars in Cuba, it was a leaf of choice to make some of the world's greatest cigars. Because it is one of the most challenging ones to cultivate, it fell out of favor by the 1990s. In the Hamastran Valley of Honduras, Julio Aroa took on the challenge of growing Corojo from the original seeds. And in 2000, he reintroduced authentic Corojo back to the market. With over 50 years' experience in the tobacco business, from growing and curing tobacco to cigar production, the Aroa Tobacco Farm has been able to continue to deliver products to market with authentic Aroa. Now with Jerry Tobacco, Julio and his son Husto bring their very own brand to market, each containing the authentic Aroa leaf. Tata Scan offers a mild to medium cigar, both Connecticut and Habano wrapper. Rancho Luna is a premium medium cigar available in Habano and Maduro. And Aladino is available in a 100% authentic Coro Puro, San Andreas Maduro, or Ecuadorian Connecticut, representing the golden age of cigars from 1947 to 1961. Now available at your local retailer, be sure to ask for JRE Tobacco, a legacy that is tasted in every drawer. And by Cornelius and Anthony, if you're going to be wanted for something, be wanted for something great. That's what Cornelius Bailey set out to do five generations ago, and that's what Steely ba Stephen Bailey is doing with Cornelius and Anthony Cigars. Using the finest tobaccos, Cornelius and Anthony brings to you Daddy Mac, Venganza, Meridian, Cornelius, Senior E-Sugars, and Gentum Mistress. You can find them at your local tobacconist. And by J.C. Newman Cigar Factory. Founded in 1895 by Julius Caesar Newman, J.C. Newman Cigar Company is the oldest family-owned premium cigar maker in America. For four generations and 124 years, J.C. Newman has been handcrafting some of the world's finest cigars. J.C. Newman is headquartered in an iconic 109-year-old cigar factory in the Ybor City National Historic Landmark District of Tampa, Florida. At this factory, known as El Rahol, J.C. Newman rolls premium cigars by hand and hand-operated antique cigar machines. The J.C. Newman Pensive Factory is the second largest in Nicaragua, and it's where Brickhouse, Perla de Mar, El Baton, and Quorum cigars are hand-rolled. J.C. Newman's Diamond Crown, Maximus, Julius Caesar, and Black Diamond cigars are handmade by Tabacalera A. Fuente in the Dominican Republic. With longtime partners, the Arturo Fuente family, the Newmans have founded the Cigar Family Charitable Foundation, which supports low-income families in the Dominican Republic with education, health care, vocational training, and clean water. Visit jcnewman.com to learn more. And by Alec Bradley Cigars. Alec Bradley is a family company. Alan Room had named the company after his two sons, Alec and Bradley, when they were just little tykes. Now they're all grown up, working alongside their dad, making the best damn cigars you've ever smoked. Join the family. Try one today. Learn more at alecbradley.com. So we're going to actually, we usually do this as the third segment. I switched this one up tonight to make sure we can get some good talk in. Um, and we, we don't keep you till like super, super late. Uh, <laughs> um, there's a lot been going on in the industry this year, Alan. Um, and I think if you were at the trade show, um, you, obviously we, we know that there's been a lot of, you know, the whole rebranding of the IPCPR at the PCA. And obviously Cigar Con. And we wanted to give you an opportunity to give some thoughts of what you think you saw this year um, and what you're maybe think where this is heading. Well, that's a good open-ended question. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, let me start by saying that, you know, I think the rebranding is fine. Do I think it was a little premature? 
potentially, because I think there's some other things that still need to be fixed and the branding is not necessarily one of them. Um, I mean, you guys were at the show, you were at the show, you, you, you saw what was going on. It wasn't packed. Uh, it wasn't the turnout that all the manufacturers that put up a lot of money to be there expected. Uh, but I think things, I think things can get better. Um, I think there's a lot of changes that need to be made. I happen to sit on the board for CRA and I sit as an advisory board position at PCA. Um, and I want to be part of, of progressive changes, uh, for the industry, but you know, there's a lot of pushback right now. You asked about cigar con. I mean, there's a you you see it all over the internet, right? You see it all over the blogs. You see it. You, I'm sure you're you're hearing it personally. There's a lot of there's a lot of pushback. Um, I mean, in some ways, what's what's your thought from where you stand on having a consumer component day uh, for the trade shop? I'll give I'll give my thoughts on on first PCA, then I'll go with cigar con, um, and then Aaron, you you can weigh in too. I actually thought the, the rebrand was something that was good. Mm -hmm. I can see where you think premature. I actually see where you're coming from with that. And I'll, I'll dive into that a little more. What, what I liked particularly, and I know the logo took uh, a lot of heat, but in my day job, I, I think I've mentioned this, that I kind of, a lot of times we're expected to go in front of a customer and in two minutes tell what we're going to do. And you need sometimes a visual to do that. And actually, I thought the new logo gave it a great opportunity to explain the cigar industry in like two minutes or less, mm -hmm. um, which is not an easy thing to do. So I, I think there were some good things with the with the with the uh, with the rebranding. Um, as far as like going with a full service organization, particularly, I understand why they're trying to reach out to consumers. They want to build more uh, more support. Cigar Con, just to me, it it still seems like. It, I'm not against the consumer component, but what I saw, I just felt there were a lot of holes that, that are out there right now. And I think they're going down some roads, which I just don't think are going to be very effective to make this work, in my opinion. So I think that's where I, I have some of the problems with that. Um, the, the third thing I'll say is the how this leaked out was really bad. Um, this should have never leaked out, in my opinion. And it's because people talked. I mean, so, I mean... I live in a, I, I work in a world of NDAs, so that's how I, I do business every day like that. So I, I, how this happened, I still can't understand it, but that's just, that's just me. Yeah. But I think again, that's maybe one of the problems, right? Is yeah. that, that it, it should not have been, it should not have leaked. Um, it should have been maybe more thought out. And I think that there's still, you know, there's time situations as well, you know, committing to the time of the show and, and people committing to booths and, I think seem, things seemed a little bit rushed, and that's why I said maybe a little bit premature. There are some other components that needed to be settled, which are still, I think, up in the air. Um, I can tell you, even sitting on the boards, that the consumer component, I was lukewarm on at best. And the, my mentality is, is that I ask our entire staff to come out and and deal with our customers, right? Which are the tobacconists. And to put out 100% of your effort to make sure that our tobacconists, our, tobac our, our, our brick and mortar partners are happy. And now I'm asking those guys to now engage with consumers. And yet in some way, the consumers are not my customers. They're the customers of the tobacconist. So there's a direct downline, right? We sell and we support and we brand, uh, we brand to the consumers. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. yeah, someone's calling me at the office at whatever time. So um, <laughs> maybe it's I mean, the PCA. It's not the PCA. Oh, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry guys. Um, <laughs> but ultimately, here's what it came down to for me: whether I liked it or not, I have to support the industry that's feeding my family. And so, if it's better for the industry, I'm going to do it. At the end of the day, if it's better for the industry, I'm going to do it. And there are retailers that have come out publicly and said that they're not going to support it. And I respect that because they have to do what's best for their business. But on the other side of that, I mean, I know Dave Garofalo came out and said that this is not something he's going to participate in. I respect his opinion. First of all, Dave is a brilliant guy. Uh, he is a premium tobacconist on every level. He's an author. He, he's, he's a fantastic promoter. I have a lot of respect for him and their organization. 
if you don't want to participate in cigar con don't but that doesn't mean don't come to the show right right so that's at least my opinion on it but the other thing is this cigar con is a tool to gain something at the end and that is more consumer advocacy getting more people involved but the other thing is in all honesty our our industry has to raise money we are 3.6 million dollars into lawsuits with the fda right now and who's paying for that i mean i can tell you that there's maybe 15 companies that are footing the bill for the entire industry so you have to get people involved and if you don't like what's going on may not be the time to back away it may be the time to get more involved right it may be time to say if i don't like what's going on in this industry that has supported my family and families you know around the united states i need to step in and make my two cents known and add good positive constructive feedback into the into the problem become part of the solution so yeah i'm not a big fan of maybe having a consumer day but it doesn't mean i'm not going to support it and one of the things that i said publicly was i don't care if they do a dog show if the dog show raises money so that we can fight for our right to smoke I'm going to be there and I'm going to support it. Yeah. So, so yeah. Alan, Alan, let me ask a question. You, will you, you know, being on you, you're on these advisory boards. Mm -hmm. Will you, will you, you could, you could choose no comment answers. Will you consult it on this? Uh, when we went up to the last meeting that I was at, um, I mean, we had already heard the rumblings of what was going on. You know, we, we, I had been in conversation, uh, people on the PCA board, no, knew my position before I went to the meeting. Uh, but I had to somewhat, you know, maybe make a little bit of a U-turn, and that is we understand the, the, the dire situation we're in. If we're $3.6 million into lawsuits now, and this is the beginning, there's gonna be $10 million in lawsuits for the ability for newer cigar makers, younger cigar makers to be able to comply. Uh, you know, we're fighting substantial equivalents, uh, uh, fighting the warning label, uh, situation that took place, which we only got to stay on, that all costs money. And, and if we don't do anything, we all lose. So we have to do something. If somebody has better ideas, come to the table with it. You know, let's, let's make the positive changes so that we can all continue to do what we love. Yeah. Do you, um, do you, so you mentioned, uh, the one thing you mentioned is, is do you think that cigar con is, is the only way to do that? Or do you think there are other ways they can do, they can, they can raise this money? I, I do think there are other ways, but you need to have involvement. Whatever the way that is that you decide is best for the industry and best to achieve the final goal. That's all fine by me. But at the end, we still have to fight the fight. So if there are, if there were regional cigar shows that, you know, we're able to gain more people and more involvement. Great. Um, if there was, you know, uh, it, it, what, listen, whatever it is, I don't have all the ideas on how to fix the problem. I just know I want to be part of the solution. That's fair. The, you mentioned at the start too the trade show attendance, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I, I got in a little bit of trouble, right, with this because I, all right, to say the least. But um, but I think there's a difference between trade show attendance and foot traffic, and it was clear that that foot traffic was was you didn't have to be a rocket science to see it was less. Um, do you think the trade show is in tr in trouble right now? Do you, do you put maybe this low attendance really maybe it was all on the July Fourth holiday and next year it will be better, or do you think the trade show is in some trouble and do they need to address that too? Well, I think that I, I think at some level the trade show industry is a little bit in trouble right now. People are not necessarily traveling to do trade shows, but I think there are other ways to fix the problems. I mean, one of the things that I had brought up, and I don't know if it's possible, I, I think they're looking at it, is to have the trade show earlier in the year in a more advantageous time for uh, retailers to want to come to the show. Um, I think you know when you are bringing the retailers right in the middle of their selling season, I think that's. Uh, I think that's a roadblock. So I'd love to see the show earlier in the year uh, where tobacconists can come and see everything that they want to purchase for the entire year and then have the amount and then have eight or nine months to sell the new releases. Right. I think that's 
because what happens is you have the show in July, you're coming into August where people are delivering maybe September, October, November, December, you're into the holiday and that's it. Now you're starting the beginning of the year. It's cool. But I think if you have the show earlier in the year and I think you put it in a place that's a little warmer, I think you get another 500 tobacconists who just want to get out of the cold who are going yeah. to come to pet. Very know. true. Yeah. I mean, and by the way, I, I've, I've asked a lot of my friends who are tobacconists and they're like, you have this thing in the end of February or March. I don't care where it is. I'm coming. Right. Right. So I think that the show needs to uh, hold the, the, the attendees or the show, the people showing on the floor more accountable as well to, to make sure tobacconists are coming. So, and you have to give tobacconists a reason to want to be there. Right. Right. I think there's a, I think there's a, a lot of improvement we can all make. So one question I have in regards to that um, is if you do the show earlier in the year, I know that the, the big thing that everybody jumps to is that, um, you know, the time that it is is probably because it's the cheapest to do it. Mm -hmm. But if you move it earlier and you have to spend more money, won't the manufacturers adjust their budgets to make it work for them? Maybe they scale down the booth size or something like that if they don't want to spend the extra money to make that happen. Would it be okay to let the let the people that are exhibiting kind of make that decision for themselves on how they make the adjustments for that? Yeah, I don't. I it, it, again, Aaron, that's a, it's a good question, but I, I actually don't think the problem is necessarily on the side of the people showing. I think mm -hmm. what happens is it's more expensive, let's say, for hotel rooms for tobacco right. to come out. Sure. But if you look at the attendance now in the summer, it's low, mm -hmm. so they're still not coming, right? Right. <laughs> so the ones the ones who are the, the ones, the tobacconists that are going to show at the show, are going to come and attend the show, if it costs them another thousand dollars, but they also are going to be, let's just say hypothetically in South Florida and you have a golf tournament and it's three days instead of three and a half or four days, and they may bring their family down, have a little vacation with it, come and spend two and a half days at the show, get their business done and be in a happier place. Right. And I think, I think that's what the concern is from the PCA. Uh, if the, if it's a little more expensive, let me put it this way, right? If you, if you look at the show as an advertising opportunity in some way, so if you, if you put an ad in a magazine that has 250,000 subscribers, you pay X. If it has a million subscribers, you pay Y, right? Yep. So if it costs me more money, but I have a thousand tobacconists there, it's right. paid for itself. Yep. I have a thousand opportunities instead of a lower number. Yeah. So I think that ultimately takes care of itself, but we need to get more people, I think, on the show floor involved. There's a lot of really bright people within our industry, and they don't have a voice right now, and they don't know what's going on. And I think it's important to bring them all together. You know, there's this new Boutique Cigar Association, and those guys need to be heavily involved. That's the future of the business. I put my kids in that same part of the industry, right? That's our future. So why not give them a voice? Let's hear what their needs are and what their desires are and start to tailor a show that gets them involved. They're out speaking to the tobacconist every day. Hey, you have to come to the show. You, there's a great energy. I think the show can't go away because I think the show's galvanizing. I think it brings the industry together. Yep. So it's important for me to make sure the show does exist. I also feel that the re there's a, a bit lost from the retailer side in regards to how they perceive the show. If they're only thinking of it as a, a buying event, I think that they're missing out on a lot of opportunity in regards to um, networking with other retailers um, to grow their business, finding out what works for other retailers and things like that. Kind of more of a, as a peer group, as an additional component to the buying piece of it. I mean, I know they all like to, you know, get together after hours and have a good time, but there's a lot of opportunity that they have to improve their business that I think that they're missing out on. And the PCA can probably also help that out in, in coming up with um, more in-depth uh, seminars and things like that to really engage the retailers in regards to improving their business. I, I agree. I agree. And, and that's why I said you have to give the retailers a reason to come. Right. It can't just be the deal. Right. It has to be that they're gaining more out of it, whether it was new POS that they are looking at, uh, new humidification, air handlers, whatever it may be that you have. You, they, there's a bit of there's an education component that could be added to this. Right. Um, and I think you have to you have to entice the retailers to want to come down. I think there are ways to do that. 
you know, I think there are some very creative ways to do that. Uh, but these are all changes. And I think that the PCA board is, is open to it because I know they want it to exist and, and they want it to, to see it flourish. They want to see it thrive. But we have to get more, ultimately, we have to get more people involved. And at the end, we still have to raise money. At the end, I hate to say it for what it is. It's honest. But right. we have potentially $10 million in lawsuits over the next five or six years. Yeah. The same 15 companies can't be supporting it. Right. right. And, and when you have... I mean, I'll give an example. You guys deal with a, with a lot of brand owners and, and, and cigar manufacturers. And maybe you should be asking them on some level, what are you doing to support the industry? I mean, if, what do they say? I support IPCPR. What does that mean by attending the show? Well, yeah, you get something views. out of that. Yeah. What, else, what else are you doing? I mean, if you look at the CRA sampler packs that they sell to raise money, we donate, you know, we all donate those cigars. Yeah. 10,000 cigars at a time. Plus the amount of money. I mean, I'll tell you one story. I remember a few years ago, we had to hire a lobbyist. It was a, uh, it was a, it was a congressperson, a, a, a congressman that um, had lost their seat, but they had a very good relationship with one of the government offices, and we hired them. And the bill was ninety thousand dollars. So up and above all the money that we already contribute, there were six companies that ponied up fifteen grand yeah. in addition to pay the bill. So how long can that keep happening until right. everyone says, well, wait a minute, what about everyone else at the show that's benefiting from the industry? Yeah. So. Yeah. Aaron and I see a lot of this, like, and I use this term interest versus commitment. I think everyone's interested in, in helping the industry, but then there's that commitment piece and that commitment piece often was with a checkbook and yes. time. Right? right. And that's the part where we see a lot of times companies fall short. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's the whole, it's, it's the ham and egg scenario, uh, scenario, right? The chicken is involved, the pig is fully committed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. <laughs> that's what it, it's, it's that mentality. And that is, if you want to see changes and you want to have potential sustainability uh, with your own brand in this industry, the industry has to survive. And to do that, we have to continue to fight the fight. That's at the end of the day, it's what it comes down to. Do you worry, Alan, that seeing, like cigar con the consumer things for for the 10 years i've been going to ips bear it, it's one of it's always been a controversial issue do you worry that this is a divisive issue and could cause more harm as opposed to bringing the industry together in, in a time like this well it's proving already to be divisive right yeah yeah i mean you you see it we all hear it um i think a lot of it is because the information has not flow you know flowed properly out to everybody who can be involved I mean, there are questions that were asked of me. I don't have all the answers, but if a consumer that walks in is going to get 40 cigars and there's 150 brands on the floor, what 40 cigars are they getting, right? So, you know, there's, there are a lot of these components that need to be worked out and maybe those answers exist and I just don't know them, but there may be other ways, again, that are more galvanizing that bring the industry closer together than tear it apart. Yeah. And I'd, love to, I, I'd love to have all that input. Um, especially from people that I know in this industry that really care. I'll give you, uh, let me give you one example. He's probably going to be pissed that I do this, but I had a conversation with Eric Espinosa on the floor and he's like, nobody talks to me. Nobody is asking me my opinion. Right. And I said, Eric, you have myself, <laughs> right? So get involved and I'll be the conduit to get you involved. And Eric called me. He's like, Hey, I'm working on some, some political stuff in Miami. And you know, I have some connections there. I mean, that's what we need. You know, we need guys like Eric who are a personality, who want to be involved, and we need to give everybody that opportunity. You know, Eric's a bright guy. He's been in this industry a long time, right? So why oh, yeah. shouldn't we have all of that as, as becoming a singular source for good information and, and, and good execution? So, yeah, I think a PCA needs to take a page out of that book in regards to involving everybody a little bit more than rather than just making a kind of a rash decision and saying like, all right, we're doing this. We haven't really planned it out yet, but we're going to make it happen. Uh, you all need to fall in line and kind of figure it out. It just, that seemed like the wrong path to take that down. Well, I think their hand was forced on some level because there are commitments that you have to make to be able to right. get a trade show, right. And time of year and commit to the hotels and commit to all those things. And so I think they were, they were rushed. I wish if, you know, if they had their, I think if they had their way, they had their druthers, they would have been able to get everything in place first, but time just didn't elapse. Right. But I can tell you that 
it's a really bright group of people on that on that board, um, and they want involvement. I'm not sure 100 percent they know exactly how to get it, right? But I know they want it, and I think they would be open to hearing conversation. Um, and again, some of the conversations I had the last day of the trade show when I kind of walked around for the first time, people had questions. So those questions need to be answered. And then people need to ask, what is it that you're looking for? What is it that it would take from your side to get you more involved, for you to get more tobacconist involved so that we all benefit? And I, th I still think that that has to happen. Now, they may kick me off the board after this <laughs> because I'm being a bit critical, but my intent is good. Right. You mentioned earlier, and I actually, I think they should have waited one more year to, to launch Cigar Con. I think if they're going to do it, I think they should wait until 2021. That's just my opinion. But you mentioned some at the beginning. You said you thought the rebranding was a little premature. Can you explain why you thought that? Yeah, I think what happens is if you're going to rebrand, you want to come out that when people are looking at the brand, they have a good positive feeling towards it. Yeah. Right? And so you asked a question whether I felt Cigar Con was divisive or are there other ways. That should have been thought out. I think that when you come out as a rebrand, you want people excited about the rebrand, not a negative mm -hmm. connotation from the beginning. Right. Because it was overshadowed by the Cigar Con announcement. It, it was, yeah. Because I think there was a lot of things that they had in the, the PCA announcement, which were good. I think in a lot of even what we talked a lot about it, Aaron, was overshadowed because of Cigar Con looming. Right. So I would have sold them on the vision of PCA year one and then year two kind of maybe pitch this idea or kind of have it. And then you have a little more chance to develop But That was my feeling on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Again, a little bit under the gun, right? I, I, I wish it was, had, had been a better, a little bit better timeline on the announcements and those things. But again, we have lawsuits looming and we have bills that need to be paid. And um, we, you know, if this is not the way and there are better ways, I think that we need to explore that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, they can bring things back to how it was in previous years where they were kind of opening it up to non cigar products like uh, hookah and vape. And they had some other various products and things like that. I mean, those, those are all contributing some money to it. So, I mean, th th there's options that way as well, but um, I know that they got a lot of bad feedback from retailers and things like that, that they didn't want those products that they weren't really interested in dealing with at the show. But you know, it's a, it's a conduit to bring in more money for the organization. Well, let's, let me say this, the negative feedback that they had received, look mm -hmm. at the attendance. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, if it's it a dozen people complaining, but 300 more retailers would show up by having it. Right. Be thinking about that. Yeah. yeah and, I, and I guess a fair point, you know, we talk about this declining attendance. It's, it's not coincidental that the attendance declined when those exhibitors were no longer there. So that's a very fair point. Yeah. Uh, that a lot of people don't talk about. Yeah. If we're trying to make the industry stronger, then you have to take everybody into consideration that, that attends that show. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else you want to hit on that, Aaron? I don't think so. Alan, anything else you want to hit on that? I got a couple more. I want to hit with you on this real quick. Yeah. Just, you know, if I was going to say one thing and that is, uh, uh, as of right now, um, you know, become a member of CRA. Um, you know, it's a consumer rights group. I can tell you that the people who sit on that board are extremely involved in every part of this industry. Um, we just need help to keep the industry together. You know, we think about the passion that you have to do what you guys do now, right? Right. If 60%, 70%, 80% of the brands on the market disappear, which is, which potentially is a reality, that passion that excitement for new product, new personalities, it dwindles and eventually goes away. So we can't allow that to happen, right? We have to, we have to bring everybody together. We need more involvement. We need PCA. If it's going to be the voice, then it has to be the proper voice for everybody. And I, you know, I, I'd like to be again, part of the solution of trying to bring people together. But everyone, everyone who's listening right now, Coop, they can, yep. they can get involved. Right. Yep, they can. They can get involved. They can get involved. They have CRA. They can renew. They can they can put an extra um, thing in there. You know, right. so, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely not. You know, we online media has been under the microscope a lot lately, and it's not just because of PCA. I mean, we, we, we constantly are hearing from 
we, we always get it. There's always a few retailers every year that say we don't belong there at the trade show. Alan, what's your opinion, one, on online media at the trade show, first, I'll ask. Are you, and you could be as candid as you want about that. And I will. I will okay. be. Yeah. Um, I think it's a very important component. Uh-huh. Uh, and I'll tell you why. I think that, you know, you can't do national TV ads, right? right? So you have to find ways to get the word out. And I think that all of you guys in the media provide a service. So, and you do it out of passion. Okay. So no one is retiring off the money they make in the media in our industry. So no, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's from the heart. And so you guys give us an opportunity to tell our stories you're, you're in the trenches, you're getting the information out, you keep people involved, you keep consumers active and, and invested in the industry. And how can that not be a benefit to everybody involved? So uh, I have a lot of respect. And by the way, there are, in all honesty, there are different levels, right? right. There are people that do it as a hobby. Um, everyone who smokes a cigar can be a critic. That's, that's easy. Um, but there are people getting real information, telling real stories, um, promoting personalities, promoting brands because they love them and they love the industry. And there's that, that's, that's a huge benefit because we can't, honestly, we couldn't do it without you. That's, that's how I feel. So. If there was a scenario where one day online media maybe would not be at the trade show, would that have a, what kind of effect do you think that would have on the trade show and on the industry? Well, let me start by saying this. So you said you were up at our party, right? Yep. Yep. It was a press party. Yep. It was. <laughs> that was a press party. That was to give everybody an opportunity to, if they wanted to do interviews, see the product before so that they could go and do their business on the show floor every day. But they, that we had everybody there, uh, you know, the drinks were flowing, the music was playing, right? We had, we had DJ paradise, uh, who's, who's also whiskey ambassador, I mean, we, we tried to create an atmosphere for people to come in and have a good time, see what we're doing. If we didn't think it was important, an important part of, of the industry, we never would have made that investment. So we think the press is vitally important to what we do. I think if they were not allowed on the trade show floor, I think it would be a disservice to the industry. Um, I, but let me say this too. I also believe that if you, if this is your hobby, and you want to come in as media, I think you still need to pay to get into the show. Well, I agree. I've always, I never had a problem paying. Yeah. I know some firms have, but I haven't. Yeah. I, I think that's important because you need to support the industry yeah. as well. Yep. So I, I, and that's not a money play. I just think sometimes it, it, it weeds out those right. who are really into it from those who are just hobbyists. Yep. Mm-hmm. No, I, I totally agree. Um, and you know, I put myself in the, the jobby category where I do operate what I do as a business, but like you said, um, I'm not going to retire on it. I thought about it last year when I switched careers, <laughs> right, last year, and it was like after two days, I realized, no, I'm going to have to get another paying job for the next 10 years, <laughs> So, <laughs> which I had to do, right? So so I kind of figured that out very quickly because, there is, like I said, there is a passion involved with that as well. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's important because if our stories are going to be told, we need the outlets to be able to do it, and you guys provide that service. I do want to say that the event that you put on for the media was a very good event. Um, it was very helpful. Um, I think it, you know, anytime that you have uh, additional face time with people and being able to get, you know, get discussions and have, and have things like that, it's always helpful. Um, it's definitely one of the better events. I think that the, it's organized for the media. Yeah. Um, so you guys did a very good job in that. Um, and, uh, you know, there's certain parties where like you'll, you want to just pop in for a little bit and then there's other things that are more interesting and things like that. It, that wasn't the case for your event. That was the, that was the event that right. day. And that, I don't think, you know, anybody was kind of popping in and popping out of that. They were the, you know, they were there for the event and every, I think everybody stayed for, you know, the majority of the night. Well, I, I think what was cool is, you know, if you look at the venue in itself, you know, we're on the 59th floor with an amazing view of Las Vegas nobody was pressured to do anything other than to go in and just enjoy themselves and have a good time. Um, we hired, um, a chef, chef Nicole Brisson, who ran all the Batali Bastianich group in Las Vegas, just opened up her own, um, her own restaurant off the strip called Locali. And so and we know Nicole, chef Nicole for years. So we tried to provide really high quality food. 
if you looked at the whiskey that we did, we didn't skimp on any of the any of the liquid that was there. No, uh, you know, with William Grant and and Glenn Fittick and Balvenie and all those brands that were there, we wanted to show you guys a level of respect that we you know we feel at our company that you guys deserve, and that was to come in and relax. If you had questions, we were there to answer it. Um, you got to see Lars, like you said, you had conversation with Lars at some time and, and he was a cool guy. We wanted to show that we wanted Alec and Bradley to get their own FaceTime with the media so that, you know, if there are questions on these two young cigar makers, what, you know, what they were about. And, uh, I think everyone enjoyed themselves and we were happy we did it. So. No, we, like I said, I, I can echo Aaron's thoughts as well. I, I was actually exhausted when I got there. Right. And, uh, and I kind of got rejuvenated towards the end of that, which, which was pretty, I don't know if it was that, um, Maybe it was that elixir I took, which was the hangover thing. That like, even though I wasn't yeah. drinking, I had yeah. it with like no alcohol, and it maybe rejuvenated me. Is yeah. all that? <laughs> yeah, because it's actually vitamins, and, and yeah. one, one has caffeine and one doesn't. But right. uh, yeah, I mean, the truth is, at one point I did see you, and I was like, "Ah, oh, should I get him a pillow and a blanket?" Because you, <laughs> you were pretty lounged on the couch over there. Yeah, it was. Uh, I actually had some health issues earlier in the year, and uh, so I've been a little. I was that was my my first like night out, like since I had kind of recovered, I had a blood infection as folks may know, wow. but, but yeah, so, uh, I was just always, I've been trying to be a little more conscious of my health and I was like, so I got there and I was beat. Right. But yeah, I, I had that sec it was relaxing and I got that second win there, which was good. So, and was, I think I was one of the last people to leave as you know, so I can tell you though, it was good to have you guys there. No, we, 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 we really appreciated it. So thank you very much for you and everyone on the team there as well. It was uh, our pleasure. Yeah. Um, last question, Alan, and this has kind of come up, um, Actually, we have one more section. We're going to do it you a fun section. But this this question in terms of um, – you okay time-wise? Yeah. Okay. We won't keep you super late. No problem. Uh, okay. Um, you know, this there's been a lot of talk right now about, like, now Facebook, which has become a, a de facto social media platform for not just everywhere in the cigar industry as well. There's a lot of new restrictions going on there. How are you as a company right now going to deal with some of these – you know, potential challenges right now with the social media platform, particularly because you guys are getting much more engaged in social media over the past few years. Mm -hmm. Well, and by the way, that's really because of the kids now in the business, right? Yeah. Uh, it, it, if it was up to me, we'd probably still be what we did 10 years ago. But um, yeah, I mean, look, we're going to comply. We don't sell cigars directly to consumers, right? We don't do trades and do any of those things. So it really comes down to the 18, 18 and over situation for us, but we're still going to you know, do what we do. We're still going to be creating new content for social media. Um, and we're, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll comply with the rules and continue to still promote our business that way. Uh, and we're actually going to take a, a, a more active stance social media wise, but we'll comply. You know, Alan, I, I, I think it's unfair. Yeah, so. it is. Yeah. You know, I saw the video you did from, from the factory last week, mm -hmm. and, and I loved it. I, you got to do more of that. And here was the thing that was really, to me, that was the first time I got to look inside that factory ever, which was, to me, that was, so I was like looking inside that factory, and I'm like, wow, this is a really nice factory when I saw that. So that was, I think, something that you guys showed that, you know, we hadn't really seen before, something like that, uh, which I thought was excellent there. And we're going to do more uh, on my next trip back. We'll do some things in the packaging area. And, you know, to see what to kind of show what that is and maybe uh, in our aging room, uh, things of that nature. But um, people, people want to know more about us. And I have not done a good job in, in making myself available to do that. But again, I can't ask our company and the people within our organization to be more involved on social media if I don't do it myself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there'll be, unfortunately, there'll be more of me on the Internet. That's not a bad thing. <laughs> it kind of is. That's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. So, Alan, any, anything else there? I do have another question. Um, yep. Alan, what are your thoughts on TPE, and does Alec Bradley have any plans to uh, attend that? Well, we haven't attended it yet. Uh, we are in conversation with them now. Um, we think that, you know, for us, uh, I didn't know if we necessarily had the product line mm -hmm. to, to hit that market uh, effectively. But I think now with, uh, with Lars as part of our portfolio and part of our company, uh, I think that's, that's a show we're probably going to attend and I think we'll make a, a good impact there. We don't want to do anything half-assed. We just, it's not our company. So if we think that we can be effective and, and make a good positive showing, then we'll attend the show. Perfect. But I do, but I do not think it's a replacement 
for the PCH. I, I totally agree with that. I, I would totally agree with you on that. Yeah. Okay. So let's just do one more word from the people uh, sponsors, and then we'll get into uh, the Alec Bradley Live True segment, Alan. Okay. All right. All right. All right. With Dub Martin Tobacco and Trust, Master Blender Steve Saka set out to create Pro Son Compromiso, cigars without compromise. This represents an expression of Saka's closely held values and tests in three simple words everything Saka wants to accomplish. Cigars are more than a passion of Saka, they are a way of life. As for the brands of Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust, Trobo Mesa, Mi Carita, Umbagad, Moester de Saka, Total Sostias, and the recently released Sin Compromiso at your local tobacconist. And by M. Bombay Cigars. M. Bombay Cigars represent the most admired cigar culture of Cuba. They represent the best of the best quality of tobacco to use in the aging process. M. Bombay Cigars are enrolled in Costa Rica by some of the world's most experienced cigar rollers, given a unique spoken experience. The band portrays the detailed and artistic nature of our small industry. Try M. Bombay and the Gaia line. M. Bombay Cigars with a cigar is a way of life. And by Caldwell Cigar Company. Caldwell Cigar Company launched in 2014 with a very simple mantra, create, innovate, ambition. Since day one, they have done things differently. They have challenged the industry to produce sticks that time and time again deliver on their promise. Look for Caldwell products or any number of collaborations at your local retailer today. And by Casa Cueva Cigars. The Cuevas family has four generations of experience in cigar making. For many years, they have manufactured cigars for many industry leaders out of their Las Lavas factory in the Dominican Republic. Now, the Cuevas family brings their own brand to market with Casa Cuevas Cigars. Try Casa Cuevas Connecticut, Abano, Maduro, and the Prensado and limited edition Flaco line extensions. If they don't carry it, be sure to ask your local retailer for Casa Cuevas Cigars. Casa Cuevas from our casa to yours. And then just a quick uh, meet update this week uh, on uh, my, my, my steak. I think I mentioned last week I'm back eating meat again. So uh, <laughs> uh, after, after my triglycerides went through the roof, uh, so I'm back smoking cattle baron cigars with that. But uh, I, I have to go back for another piece of lab work. So we'll see what happens with that. <laughs> but I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. So uh, actually, uh, I think it was just a spike after Vegas of all the meat I ate. <laughs> Yeah, I ate a lot of meat out there. I can, I can tell you, I just checked. My phone is blowing up right now on the show. So <laughs> We've had a very good audience. All right, so I want to get into the Alec Bradley Live True segment. And uh, I want to also mention it's sponsored by Alec Bradley. Do you really want to hear about another cigar that talks about fillers, binders, and wrappers, and aging ratings? Blah, blah, blah. How about this? Pick up an Alec Bradley cigar, smoke it, enjoy it. Spend an hour, and you'll be one happy camper. Learn more at alecbradley.com. So, Alan, in our Live True segment, we take a little bit of a, of a break from the hardcore cigar talk that we've been doing tonight. Mm-hmm. And in particular, I wanted to find out about you, – you mentioned that a lot of people don't know you, right? So I wanted to ask you some questions that are not cigar-related. Uh, okay. You can choose to answer them, or you could choose to say no comment. But okay. uh, not, nothing, nothing's going to um, – I don't think there'll be anything earth, earth-shattering here that will be uh, – so we just want to learn a little more about you because I think folks probably want to know a little more about you. So here's my first question, Alan. What's your favorite type of cuisine? Uh, that's a good question. I'm kind of all over the board, but I'm, I'm really a, a, a steak guy. There you um, go. Not necessarily right. steak and potatoes, but I'm, I'm a steak guy and I, and I like my steak either with nothing on it or maybe a little bit of salt and pepper. And even like, the, the stuff is magic yeah, on the steak. Yeah. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't yeah. need a lot of it. <laughs> even if I'm going to a hamburger joint for the first time, I get it with nothing on it. I want to taste the quality of the meat that they're giving me. So I think that's more my style. Yep. All right. Your favorite television show, it could be past or present. What's your favorite television show of all time? Uh, probably was Boston Legal. Ah, yeah. that's, a good, that's a good one. Yeah, I think it was witty. I thought it was, you know, well acted. And, uh, and then they always finished uh, with a cigar. So, yeah. All right. A movie that you can watch over and over and over again and never get tired of it. I'm not much of a movie person, so let me let me start there. Okay, um, I, I probably spend more time reading business books or uh, you know books on how to improve you know personally than I do watch movies. But I have to say, I just saw Bohemian Rhapsody for the first mm-hmm. time, and I think that's something I would watch over and over. I thought it was unbelievably entertaining. I have to still see that. I haven't seen it yet. It's phenomenal. Yep. I usually don't go to the movie theater. I usually I'm now lazy and I wait for it to come out. Uh, on Amazon, uh, except if it's a, if it's a Rocky movie, then I go. I got you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, an album, a musical album that's on your iPod or iPhone. 
Man, I'm all over. I am from uh, more recent would probably be uh, Action Bronson's last uh, album that he released. Uh, a lot of old Biggie stuff, uh, 50 Cent. But, oh, you're, you're a hip-hop guy. You're a hip-hop guy. Yeah, I mean, but I, I also, I, I mean, I like country. I listen to some jazz. I, I listen to some of the old uh, Italian opera guys. So I'm kind of all over the place. It's whatever turns me at the moment. Okay, that's fair. That's kind of how I am, too. A state in the United States that you haven't visited, but you'd like to visit. Can I change that question for one second? Yes, you can. Okay. Yeah, this is this is your segment. <laughs> okay. So recently, I went to Lincoln, Nebraska. Okay. I never really thought I would be in Lincoln, Nebraska. So, yeah. but we created a great relationship with uh, Capital Cigar Lounge out there, and I went out for a few days, and I have to tell you probably the nicest group of people. I probably met over a couple of days. I met two to 300 people while I was there. And the first thing out of their mouth was either welcome to Lincoln or how are you liking Lincoln, Nebraska? I mean, every single person asked me that. So instead of a state that I have not been to, I'd like to say that I was so pleasantly surprised that I felt like I walked out of there with like a hundred new family members <laughs> when I left uh, and how I was treated. Um, but, uh, you know, it's funny. I have not been to Minnesota, not on business anyway. Mm -hmm. I've been to Minnesota for other reasons, but not on business. And I think I'd like to go back and visit the, the tobacconist out there because it's a small group, but a really dedicated group of people. Mm -hmm. Finding out, I just switched roles in my company and I'm moving into more of a territorial role. And I have the Southeast living in, in the Charlotte area, but I drew Minnesota as a state. So I'm going to be going up there, I know, from time to time. I've only been there once, so uh, and that was a long time ago before I was even smoking cigars. So I'm, I'll, I'll have to let you know how it is. I'd love to hear. Yeah. Okay. Now, kind of same same question, but we'll change it, and you could change the question also here. Uh, country in the world you haven't visited, but would like to visit. Um, I think I'd like to go to to Austria. Uh, I have not been there. Oh, I want to go there. Yeah. Yeah, but I think I'd like to like to go to Austria, maybe, and also if not, maybe spend a little time in Asia, and I haven't been there as well. So I'm not yeah. sure where exactly in Asia yet, but <laughs> uh, I think going to Japan would be kind of cool. I think I'd like to do that. That would be cool. I haven't been there either. I haven't been there either. I was supposed to go to Hong Kong last year, and then that's when I got the blood infection, so that wasn't happening. How yeah. are you feeling now, by the way? I'm I mean, feeling like, great. Do you know? Do you know when I was in the office that day, Alan? Is when Actually, I was starting to have the beginning signs of it. Um, it was actually that weekend. I was down there for the Espinosa thing, and uh, that's when I actually started feeling the signs, and I was ignoring it, unfortunately. So, yeah. uh, But I'm feeling great now. I got through the trade show, and that was a big thing for me. Good. Yeah, Good. appreciate it. All right, two more, and I think I know the answer to the last one, but uh, what's your favorite breakfast cereal? Um, God, that is so random. <laughs> <laughs> we were uh life life cereal mikey yeah you know i find that every person who's like our age they have a kid's breakfast cereal they like the two yeah you know, like, yeah like mine was blueberry you know it's a the, the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i could i could put down fistfuls of uh of life and be okay with that there you go yeah. there you go you know it was sad as my my uh my youngest boy didn't even know who mikey was <laughs> he's, he's gonna be 19 he has no clue who mike i said you don't know who mikey is because we have it in the house. No, I'm like, yeah, oh, geez. I, that's when I felt dated. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Yeah. Okay. And the last one, I think I know the answer to this. What's your favorite spectator sport? It's a good question. Um, this is gonna this is gonna be terrible, but I I probably watch golf. The most. I, that's what I thought you were gonna say. Yeah. Alan, golf is like in Charlotte is the biggest spectator sport, maybe next to football and college basketball. It, it, people watch golf like religiously in, in, in North Carolina, all the tournaments. They're really into it. Yeah. I mean, I, I like football, but more recently, I think I've been a little bit bored. I've been a little bit bored with football, but, um, you know, I've watched it my whole life and believe, uh, you know, I'm born and raised in South Florida, but I grew up a Packers fan and I, Oh I, wow. Yeah. And, and no one understood why, but I was a Vince Lombardi fan. Actually, I have some Vince Lombardi stuff on my wall in the office and because I liked the way he, he ran that team like it was a company. And so I was always inspired by that. And I was a Bart Starr fan. So 
Uh, I grew up a Packers fan for that reason. Uh, I'm born and raised in South Florida, so I'm a Dolphins fan just because I am. But, uh, yeah, I mean, if I'm going to watch any sport, uh, first of all, if I'm going to do anything, I'd rather go play. I played sports my whole life. Uh, I played actually men's men's football, you know, up until my early 40s. And I used to play competitive softball five nights a week. So I'd much rather go play a sport. But if I'm going to watch it, it's, it's golf. There you go. Who's your favorite golfer? Um, I like this uh, this new kid, uh, Matt Wolf, that just came out, uh, just because his swing is so unique. Um, I'm a big Ernie Els fan just because, you know, his, his swing is iconic. I like some of the older golfers, Colin Montgomery, uh, Tom Lehman, some of those guys, just because I'd like to emulate those type of swings. Um, how could you not be a Kepka fan right now? Right. You know, so. Yeah, no, very, very true. I was a, I'm not a huge golf guy, but I always like Watson growing up. Yeah, I mean, this is a guy whose career, you know, that's it. everyone should have in their professional life. Everyone should have a, a career like Tom Watson. I totally agree. So, yeah, you know, I'm not. Uh, I remember when he, like, I'm not a big golf guy, but when he made that comeback ten years ago at the British Open, I was watching it. I was like yeah. into it. Yeah. yeah. And again, if you know, just the fact that Tiger is back, uh, that does great things for that sport. Right. Um, you know, the, the viewership is way up, and I love all the young guys that are coming out now. Uh, I just think that the, the sport's in a good place right now. Yeah, I, w- I was talking to someone. I said if Tiger and Kepka had a one-two battle in a major tournament, it would be – I mean, people would be going nuts. I mean, across the country, especially in Charlotte. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I played golf out, uh, golf out in Charlotte. Uh, it was uh, incredible. Yeah, so, it's very very popular. Like I said, yeah, they play it a lot here too, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Aaron, anything else we want to add here? I don't think so. All yeah, right. a pretty good list. All right. Yeah, kind of. Uh, so, Alan, um, before we go, uh, I want to first of all thank you very much uh, for taking the time to do the show. I mean, we do really appreciate it. Um, and, you know, thank, thanks so much for your candor. And, and hopefully this won't be the last time we have you on the show either. No, absolutely not. But I have to tell you, as, as much as you say that you appreciate it, I do. Um, gives me an opportunity to, to, to speak to your listeners and, and directly and uh, let them know that, you know, the, the industry is alive and, and there's a lot of passion in this industry and we get it. And, you know, we want to do everything possible to, to be a positive influence and force uh, within the industry. Yeah. And I, I really like to getting to know your company over the past couple of years. Like I have, I, I can honestly say that you guys are doing a very good job with that. Thank you. Yep. All right. Um, just a quick programming note. Um, next week, uh, we have two shows. We'll get, Bear and I will be doing special edition uh, number 58 on, t- on Tuesday. Um, and then on Thursday, we'll be back for primetime. Uh, special guests. Uh, we really had some great guests. Uh, we're going to have Rafael Nadal, uh, Altidus and Boutique Blend. So he'll be making his debut on the show. So we're very excited about that as well. So you'll want to tune in for that at 10 p.m. next Thursday. Alan, thanks so much again. Uh, yeah, best of luck to you. If we, if I don't, I'll probably, be, I, maybe I'll try to see you from down in Florida um, in September if you're around. But uh, if not, we'll catch up soon. I'm sure. Uh, Will, Aaron, thank you very much. Uh, oh, I should mention one other thing real quick. Uh, Alec and Bradley will be doing special edition on the 20th of of August, so we'll have them on as well. I'll make sure to tune in. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. See, see what negative things they have to say about their friends. <laughs> That's good. All right. Anyway, that's going to wrap up Primetime, episode 104 into the Annals of History for Thursday, August 1st, 2019, now August 2nd, 2019 on the uh, East Coast. We'll see everybody next week. Have a great night, everybody. Guys, thank you again. Thanks, Alan. Be well. All right, bye-bye.